Hey everybody, Dustin here. Welcome back to a one of my first ever documentaries. This is basically one on the RMS Titanic. This is the one I have done in maybe early March to now April. Now this is a combination of all nine parts smashed into one giant documentary instead of individual videos. Now there is going to be another video that will be coming out later on. It's not going to be basically, you know, me talking about the ship's history here or there. It's basically going to be a music video, and I haven't decided the song. So, and no, it's not going to be My Heart Will Go On or Sleeping Sun, so you can forget about those two options right there. <laughs> so, yeah. So, this is going to be a documentary combined into one giant video. And also, if you see me wear different shirts, that tells you you just transcended from one video to another. Or if you notice the different background changes, like for example, back here or my bedroom with the lights. So, so once again, sit back and enjoy this whole documentary from start to finish. In the annals of maritime history, one name echoed through time with a haunting resonance, the RMS Titanic, a vessel unsinkable, yet destined for tragedy. This time, I take you on a journey back in time to unravel the captivating tale of the RMS Titanic, from its early years to its unfortunate demise. It's the early 20th century, an era of opulence and grandeur. Men started building massive ships never imagined. Two rival companies are matched to prove who has the best ships. Ships like the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa, the RMS Lusitania, and the RMS Martina started showing up on the scene, to which they held the Blue Ribbon, an accolade for the fastest transatlantic crossing. However, three countries were locked in the war altogether, the United States of America, Germany, and the United Kingdom. However, they weren't looking for speed to win the Blue Ribbon, they want to respond to who can build the biggest and safest ocean liners afloat. A ship over 882 and a half feet long with four grand funnels. Three functional while one serves for show. Titanic was built in five years from 1907 from the paperwork signing to 1912. Taken down by an iceberg in under nearly three hours. Killing 1,500 to the North Atlantic Ocean. So how can a grand ocean liner like the Titanic sink days into her maiden voyage? The Titanic was born in a shipyard called Harlan and Wolf Shipyard, located in Belfast, Ireland. Today, that same area where the Titanic slipped out of is still in existence as part of the Titanic Belfast extraction. Belfast, Ireland, home to Harlan and Wolf Shipyard, the lifeblood with the talent. Two large slipways with large gantries were built to accommodate Titanic and the first ship of its class, the Olympic. Named after the Olympians, Titanic was named after the Titans, respectively. It took 14,000 workers to build both Olympic and Titanic, and tensions between the Catholics and Protestants are on the rise. One in eight workers are Catholics. No one was blind to religion, though, but important was still the division between the trades and the kings of the yards, with the toughest jobs were the riveters. Then, in 1907, the chairman of the White Star Line, Bruce Ismay, sat down with Lord William Pierre, who is the chairman to the Harlan and Wolfe shipyard, during dinner in his London home. However, Ismay is actually forced with a challenge. Cunard Line is actually building faster ocean liners that can cross the Atlantic within five days. So, Pierre decides to draw up a sketch of a ship that will be much bigger than the Mauritania and the accommodations of the most luxurious designs imaginable. To compete with Cunard, they would need at least to build two ships. But it was actually later changed to three. So, two men who are also responsible for helping to build with the Titanic is Alexander Carlyle and, of course, Lord Pierre's nephew, Thomas Andrews Jr. The man you see in this photo is Roderick Chisholm. He is the chief draftsman to Harlan and Wolfe as he worked closely with Thomas Andrews and was at the forefront in the design. 
Carlisle is skeptical about these ships being turned into existence, but Roderick convinced Carlisle that he can turn a vision into a reality. With the new liners, change is coming, which means new shipyards and new gantries. Pierre appointed a photographer named Robert Welch, who photographed Titanic's progress under construction, which you'll see in this video later on. In July of 1908, Jay Bruce is made sat down with Carlisle, Pierre, Andrews, and Chisel. So Ismay noticed the prototype of the model presented to him that Titanic had four funnels. The reason to this is that the more funnels the ship has, the keener the paying public is to travel on the ship. Cunard built the Lusitania and the Mauritania with four functional funnels, and work on a ship with the yard 400 begins after Ismay signing the Harlan and Wolf paperwork and yard 401 some months after. 400 would be named the Olympic, and 401 is appropriately named Titanic named after the Olympians and Titans, respectively. Afterwards, two large cradles of gantries were built. 6,000 tons of steel acts as a skeleton towering 200 feet, which is taller than the Westminster Abbey. Mobile cranes in the center provide an intricate system designed to reach every part of the ships under construction. On December 16, 1908, the keel of Hull 400 was laid down and work is underway. The keel plates took the height of a man, easily reached by the 7-ton riveting machine suspended from the gantry. Wind blocks were actually installed carefully, ready for launch later on. It is March 31st, 1909, 115 years ago today, that the keel of the Titanic was laid down in the same process as the Olympic. The skeleton steel frames of the Titanic were made and prepared. The steelwork was bent to match as the 300 frames were reared into place. Lord Pierre's ambitions were actually growing, but they are very, very political as well. And considering the fact that he is a unionist, he is actually happy with Ireland's place in the United Kingdom. And then overnight, he kind of turned into a nationalist. So Ireland would actually do prosper more if they were actually free from rule by London. But many of the Irishmen actually share this vision, and they actually call it home rule. But keep this in mind, though. Home rule is actually playing with fire. So... There's going to be a lot of tension that's actually building within the shipyard. So most, mostly those against home rule, including his own workers, as Titanic being built, a rip actually starts to develop. As we now hit 1910, which has been officially a year since the Titanic has been built, the talk of how lifeboats would actually be set up is actually brought up. Now the original concept was of 16 lifeboats with 4 at each station, giving us a grand total of 64 to which would actually do exceed the British Board of Trade regulations. However, a man by the name of Francis Caruthers, who actually re represents the British Board of Trade, who is actually in charge of ensuring the safety standards. Now, a year before Titanic's launch, and this is the, uh, the big Titanic mall I have, well, second largest actually, discussions for lifeboats and safety features were actually very crucial whatsoever. Titanic's actually fitted with 16 watertight compartments, that means from 4 peak, 3 tanks, 1 for 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and of course, engine room and the rest will be in the back. So any breach anywhere in this ship would actually be sealed off and the Titanic could be its own floating lifeboat whatsoever. But however the time, 16 lifeboats were actually... The legal requirement, since it is sufficient for a vessel of 10,000 tons or more. So Titanic is also installed with four life rafts. And as we can see, we have collapsible A and B on the uh, port side. Unfortunately, this doesn't have C or D, you know, considering the fact of the scale or the possibility of trying to add on two more. So which is very highly understandable. Titanic is also installed with four Engelhard collapsible life rafts. So... Alexander Carlyle did declare that this practice was actually out of date whatsoever and he would resign ending his involvement with the Titan considering it would be the last ship that he would ever design. The purpose of these lifeboats was not to hold the whole entire ship population out in the ocean in case of the Titan were to suffer a collision or if anything disables the ship. The North Atlantic route is always one of the busiest shipping lanes so there's always a possibility of another ship coming by at any time to stop to assist. The able-bodied ship, as you see in this video, would be able to lower an empty lifeboat and row towards the disabled ship and be carried on more passengers and row back to the assistant ship. 
Afterwards, Lord Pierre brought up his nephew Thomas Andrews to be the chief designer. On his first night seeing the Titanic in person, he noticed Halley's Comet is visible in the skies throughout Europe. Some say it was there when he took his wife Helen, who was pregnant with their firstborn, to see the ship to show it off to her. Work in the shipyard is very dangerous, especially when adding on the outer skin to the skeleton. 2,000 steel plates, all are 30 feet long and 6 feet wide, and each of them are over an inch thick, and they only weigh 3 tons. Plates were fixed with rivets hammered in by hand. Since the curvature of the ship is too complex for machine, this is where installing the rivets by hand and muscle power comes into play. There are 3 million rivets that held this ship together. And as the hulk of the ship grew, began to take place, the wind shoring were actually fixed were continuing on. Conditions were slippery and very dangerous. And working with red hot rivets, speed is everything. And as speed, danger is always close by. A worker by the name of Samuel Joseph Scott fell from the scaffolding while hammering in rivets and died on impact to the ground. He was only 15 years old and 17 workers also lost their lives while building the ship. Also, the Titanic is actually equipped with 29 boilers. This is the heartbeat that pumped 30,000 horsepower to the engines, and they were fed by 159 furnaces, which actually burn over 600 tons of coal per day. And the boilers actually do dwarf the men who actually built them, but Titanic is actually designed for efficiency, not for speed, so keep that in mind, though. Excess steam would actually be diverted through a turbine to increase her power, and that energy will be driven to a triple-bladed central manganese propeller, which is weighed about 22 tons. And as we can see on my Titanic well, we actually do have a central propeller right here. And also, the excess steam to which the reciprocating engines would power the Titanic through the open North Atlantic Ocean were actually powered by these two giant triple-bladed screws, or propellers for short, which actually weighs 38 tons each. Now these propellers would actually power the Titanic across the North Atlantic Ocean. But at this time, since we're actually two years away from the maiden voyage, and our, in my terminology, we're about two videos away from the maiden voyage. So if you'd like to keep up with this Titanic documentary, feel free to like this video, feel free to subscribe it as well, and be along for the ride as well. So how do you get these massive machinery pieces on board the Titanic? Well, you certainly cannot take them apart and reassemble them inside the ship, so you've got to get creative, though. You would need, actually, a heavy-duty crane, and finding one is actually very, very difficult considering the political political early tension that would actually kick off World War I later on. A German company is watching over the crane's construction, and as the monster of Titanic grows, the tensions began as Belfast workers were suspicious of the Germans because the Germans may be spies, which is possible because they want to steal off the ideas from the Irish workers to build a liner of their own in the future or to sell them to other competitors. However, Roderick Chisholm actually does have a way with words, though. He easily works his way to management from the shop floor and he gets along with about anyone. As a bonus, he also spoke German, and Roderick tells the German builders that to their crane, and that they finished building the crane themselves. And then at one point, there was a disagreement with the German flag being displayed, which of course around this time it would be the, the black, the white, and the red. There was a disagreement with the German flag being displayed, but it was actually quickly resolved with a beer at the pub as the German flag is actually surrendered and replaced with the Union Jack. Little we know that both the United Kingdom and Germany would go into war with each other, but that's a story for another time. On October 20th in 1910, the first ship of her class, the SS Olympic, was launched. Never been christened, which is a White Star Line tradition. The footage that you see is in black and white, which is the surviving footage along with the Britannic. The Olympic served for 24 years under the White Star Line flag, having to transport thousands and thousands of passengers and also the thousands of troops in the First World War. However, all of this will be another story for another time. Finally, on May 31st of 1911, the 24,000 tons of hull of 401 is complete, 
and gold edge lettering spells out the name Titanic. Timbers were knocked as her weight is now settled onto the sliding way, which is lubricated with 20 tons of vast quantities of soft soap, tallow, and a loud mix with oil. Attending the launch of the Titanic is Captain Edward J. Smith, which would be her future skipper, Lord Pierre, J.P. Morgan, Bruce Ismay, and 100,000 onlookers. At 12 noon, a red flag was hoisted on the jack staff of the stern, warning oncoming boats and ships to stand clear as the triggers were released. Titanic slips out into the river lagging, and at a quarter after 12, two rockets were launched, warning anyone to get out of the way. Titanic's hull is finally complete, as it took 62 seconds to be launched from the gantry to the river. This ship will be towed to the fitting out process. So everything actually did had to live up to its name whatsoever to dream of the world's greatest ocean liner. So every day counts, and there can no longer be any distractions whatsoever. So what is the fitting out process? The fitting out process of shipbuilding follows with the float out or the launching of a vessel. It's a period where all the remaining construction of the ship is completed and ready for delivery whatsoever. So this actually includes the completion of the superstructure, the ship's power plant, the engines, the machinery, equipment and systems, interior spaces, and installation of furnishings. On board the Titanic and during the maiden voyage, there's a selection of a troubleshooting team called the Guaranteed Group. These eight men would be chosen to go on the maiden voyage to troubleshoot any minor mishaps on the ship. They would be led by Thomas Andrews. The vision of Lord Pierre was coming to life. The Edwardian-style furnishing adores the first-class lounge and the smoking rooms and the elegant grand staircase located in the forward section between the first and second funnels, descended into seven levels between boat deck and knee deck. On top of the boat deck grand staircase is a clock called Honor and Glory Crowning Time. This clock was given to the allegorical wall in the neoclassical eclectic style. The accommodations of the Titan can fit 833 first-class passengers, 614 in second class, and 1,006 for third class. In addition, she has a crew capacity of 900. Titanic was laid out in the lighter style of contemporary high-class hotels. The Ritz Hotel is a huge reference, with first class furnished in the Empire style. There's also other decorative styles, which range from the Renaissance to Louis XV, were also used to decorate cabins and public rooms in first and second class. So, for Titanic and Olympic, at one point they actually do both look like each other at one point especially when both were actually in the shipyard together as we know the olympic was actually painted light gray to show up better for photographs titanic would be painted black but at a request from bruce ismay ask the builders for the titanic to enclose the front half section of the promenade deck and as we can see here here this would be the open not open the enclosed promenade deck and this rest would be open right here another request also is to may add more staterooms to B deck, except a couple of promenade suites, like for example, one on the starboard side and the other on the port side, which actually does add on more weight to the ship whatsoever. And these rooms were actually occupied made by some of the richest and some of the elitists. Like for example, B52, 54, 56 was actually occupied by Bruce Ismay on the Titanic. While yet in the 1997 film, it was actually occupied by Rose, Ruth, Cal, and Lovejoy. Unfortunately, disaster would strike on September 21st of 1911 as the RMS Olympic, which was traveling through the Solent River, drew in the Royal Navy cruiser, the HMS Hawk. No one was hurt or killed, but it penetrated the Olympics hull by two compartments, twisted a shaft, and flattened the HMS Hawk's bow, which is ironically designed to ram into enemy vessels. So the responsibility was actually labeled on Captain Edward J. Smith, who was actually in command of the Olympic around that time frame. But the Royal Navy blamed the Olympic, saying that her large displacement actually generated a suction that pulled in the Hawk. A legal argument actually ensued who was to blame for the Olympic was basically the ship was actually under the control of the harbor pilot. But the White Star Line actually did face legal bills and the costs, so it took two weeks to patch up the other uh, repair and the damage to allow her to go back into Belfast for that repairs whatsoever. So to expedite this, Harlan and Wolf were obliged to replace Olympic's damaged propeller shaft with one from Titanic. However, Titanic's builders were so easy to handle the press, telling them that the Olympic actually got off scotch-free with a collision due to automatic wire-tight doors. These were brand new 
on board both the Olympic and the Titanic, and will be later be implemented on their sister ship, the HMHS Britannic. Now think of this as a, in a nutshell whatsoever when it comes to these watertight compartment doors. Imagine trying to find the wheel and just basically trying to hand crank it and trying to close it up. It would actually take a very, very long time to get that door down and basically sealed. So how do they do it? Well, there's two different ways, but it's all similar in one go. It's electronically. So, however, anyone from the bridge can actually turn a key and throw a switch from the bridge, would actually close off the doors, but no one knows there's actually a third way, and it's called a flow plate. A flow plate is actually designed to float upwards, and if it reaches a certain height, that door closes down automatically. Now, a good example for hand crank doors is basically the RMS Empress of Ireland. When the Empress of Ireland was hit by the Storstad, Stewards who were actually certified tried to close the door manually, but they couldn't be able to get it done in time, and that's what actually caused the Empress of Ireland to roll over on its side for sure. Upon learning this, Captain Smith stated, I cannot conceive of any vital disaster happening to this vessel. Modern shipping has simply gone beyond that. However, there was a phrase that's actually thrown around. As I'm concerned, she is practically unsinkable. Then the RMS Olympic was back in service. But it didn't take long for another mishap to happen, though. Olympic lost a propeller in the February of 1912 on an eastbound voyage from New York to Southampton in February. So basically, this kind of caused a huge delay in the maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic to go from March to April, and this is actually one of the most fatal moves ever. On March 6, 1912, a photograph of the Olympic being maneuvered into the Thompson Dry Dock is taken. It would be one of the few last time both Titanic and Olympic were photographed together. And as we all know, this move appeared to be a very fatal move for the Titanic, thus delaying her original maiden voyage from March to April 10, 1912, a mishap that provided with fatal consequences. Lord William Pierre never got to see his ship make her main voyage as he was ambushed by his own workers throwing rivets at him, which were used to build the Titanic but can make deadly projectile weapons. As tensions still unfold with home rule, Lord Pierre's departure set off a rift of hostility between Catholics and Protestant workers. Home rule has put an effect on the Titanic. To the Unionists, she's a British ship. To the Nationalists, she's an Irish ship. Politics were being fueled with anger, and in the shipyard, scores were being settled. Protestant workers attacked Catholic workers very unprovoked. Once all the tensions and the mishaps with the Olympics and the fitting out process complete for Titanic, there was only one thing that the Titanic needed to go through, her sea trials. Tune in back in here on April 2nd of 2024, to which we will talk about Titanic sea trials. From where we last left off, workers at Harland and Wolf built the keel of the RMS Titanic, and for nearly two years, the ship is finally complete. But however, the fitting out process would be next for the ship, so basically they had to launch the ship from the slipway and out into the river Lagan. It is now April 2nd, 1912, 112 years ago today, that the RMS Titanic underwent her first sea trials. So what are sea trials? Well, sea trials are basically a series of tests that a ship must go undergo to prove that the ship is very seaworthy whatsoever. So, a representative from the Board of Trade actually boarded the Titanic to provide a series of tests such as acceleration, maneuverability, and a full-on crash stop. So, think of it as a restaurant undergoing its first health inspection prior before opening up to the public. Because you got to make sure that this place is safe for others to eat, to socialize, to drink. Because if they find one thing wrong in there, you basically have to go and do it all over again. So what were the tests? At first, they conducted the Titanic to go through its paces with the speed, such as going from stop to standby to dead slow, slow, half speed, and all ahead full. And then a crash stop to which it was 850 yards, which actually proves that Titanic can stop quickly very safely. A crash stop is basically going from near top speed to full astern in case the ship were to encounter something in its way. 
and maneuverability with the steering if they had to turn the ship hard to starboard or port, and it took 3,850 yards for the Titanic to do a full, complete lap, which was pretty acceptable. After the test, a safety certificate is signed off by the British Board of Trade and handed off to the RMS Titanic, and the ship is free to go to Southampton for Belfast, as sea trials were done in six hours. And also, one more thing, the safety certificate is up to a full year. And during the timing around that time frame, the sea trials in the days away from the main voyage, it actually had to be done right away, and basically doing it within six hours. They actually did a very good, reasonable job so far, even though considering what they had to go through, what the timing was, and everything, so they basically had to get it done. It is now April 3rd, 1912. 112 years ago today, the Titanic arrived at Southampton for its maiden voyage. Final preparations were made for the Titanic to be supplied with cargo, food, drinks, coals, and other supplies that ne need to keep the passengers happy. So, in a week's time, and I did actually look this up on Google, and basically the Titanic was actually supplied with, and I've actually brought it up on my computer right now, and I'd love to show you the list, but I'm going to tell you right away. So, so we have 75,000 pounds of meat, yum, 7,500 pounds of ham and bacon, 25,000 pounds of poultry, 11,000 pounds of fresh fish, 4,000 pounds of salted and dried fish, we got 36,000 apples and oranges, which actually does make a total of 72,000 apples and oranges, we have 40 tons of potatoes, 800 asparagus bundles, 2,500 pounds of great peas, 7,000 heads of lettuce, 10,000 pounds of dried beans and rice, 250 barrels of flour, 1,000 loaves of bread. <laughs> oh, Charles Yalkin got a lot of work to do anyway. 800 pounds of tea, 40,000 fresh eggs, 1,500 gallons of fresh milk, and there's also 600 gallons of condensed milk. And of course, <laughs> 15,000. Thousand bottles of ale. Um, I wonder what happened to the rest during the sinking. Well, we'll get to there. And it was also 850 bottles of liquor. And of course, there's actually 14,000 gallons of drinking water used every 24 hours. And that list is just very mind blowing indeed. So compare that list and compare it to the modernized cruise ship. And actually do compare and, you know, to see what changed over the years. So another item that the Titanic would need is fuel for its coal. Stokers would actually shovel coal into the massive boilers and into the fire so the boilers can turn that coal in to turn and create steam whatsoever. And that steam would actually go into the reciprocating engine or the turbine engines that power the propellers to turn. So the Titanic is actually a steam-powered ocean liner. And it needs a lot of coal. And under a full load, it can carry... 6,611 tons of coal, and it was stored in the ship's coal bunkers. But the question is, why? Well, you have to keep this in mind, though. One of them is the distance. Southampton to New York is about 3,000 miles away whatsoever. Titanic can actually travel on one mile for every ton of coal that has been burned. So it can carry for one trip to Southampton, New York, and vice versa. But getting that coal is actually going to be very, very difficult for the White Star Line because the United Kingdom is now experiencing a coal strike around this time frame whatsoever. The strike was actually resolved on the 6th of April while Titanic was in Southampton. But due to the strike whatsoever, there was a massive shortage of coal that's available. But the White Star Line does not want to allow Titanic to miss its main voyage just on account of a coal strike. But what they actually did was they actually made some deals from dock vessels to give that coal to the Titanic whatsoever. But due to the fact that the White Star Line is doing this, some of those passengers were actually transferred from other ships to the Titanic. And how they cut that close is so beyond me whatsoever. Like, it's just really amazing how they did it. A part of that is basically the reshuffle of the bridge officers. And this is also another ad delay as well. And just because, and I just finished up those notes and I decided to look back, see if there's anything I missed. I almost missed this little piece of information right here. An officer by the name of David Blair was actually cut from the Titanic because of the addition of Henry Wilde. Now, Henry Wilde was actually supposed to be originally on the RMS Olympic. But however, 
He was told by the White Star Line to stay in Southampton. Little he knew, he would be on the RMS Titanic. The original list for Titanic's bridge officers included from Chief on Down, William McMaster Murdoch, Charles Lightoller, David Blair, as I previously mentioned, Herbert Pittman, Joseph Boxhall, Harold Lowe, and James Moody. So, unfortunately, a reshuffle of officers and the addition of Henry Watt actually did cause a reshuffle of the chief first and second officers, respectively. So, therefore, the original list, like I mentioned, was Murdoch, Lytar, Blair, or chief officer first and second officers, respectively. However, Captain Smith brought on Henry Wilde, to whom he and Murdoch had sailed on the RMS Olympic with Captain Smith before in the past whatsoever. So, as his chief officer, this actually caused the first two officers, Murdoch and Lytar, excuse me, to be bumped down to the first and second officers, respectively. However, this would actually cut David Blair completely from the roster. And when David Blair did left the Titanic, he actually took along with him the keys for the locker for the binoculars. The next time we return is on April 10th of 2024, 112 years ago on that day, Titanic would set sail from Southampton, England for her maiden voyage to New York. From where we last left off, the construction of the RMS Titanic is complete. She underwent her sea trials and passed with all flying colors. She then later returned to Belfast, Ireland to pick up the rest of her crew and then sailed over to Southampton where she will pick up the rest of her crew at. However, the Guarantee Group would see their families for the very last time and they left their own children behind parting gifts for them to remember by. Little they knew, they would not see their fathers ever again. If you've studied the Titanic like I do, you'll find out that today, 112 years ago, is a huge deal. The RMS Titanic was set sail from Southampton to begin her maiden voyage. Now to separate the fact from fiction whatsoever, the departure from Southampton for Titanic wasn't really a big deal like we see in the 1997 film or something out of a kid's book about the ship. So to the people of Southampton, the Titanic is basically a near carbon copy of the RMS Olympic anyway. So if there would have been a celebration or a party, it would be for the Olympic. So let's actually put this in a bigger perspective. Well, literally bigger anyway. Look at the icon of the seas, which is basically from the Royal Caribbean International. And this is a very, very massive ship. But there's actually going to be another icon class ship named the Stars of the Seas, which is actually going to enter service. In the end of August 2025. But since I'm actually getting ahead of myself. The Seas of Stars is bigger. But that throw the uh, icon class would die down. So if there was like a celebration or a party or a fireworks show. That would basically be for the icon of the Seas. To the people on Titanic it didn't matter. The fact they were on the biggest ship in the world. And it's a thrill since the ship is on its main voyage. The Titanic had a good number of passengers that weren't supposed to be on there. In Southampton 908 of the crew members signed on to the RMS Titanic. While 724 came from Southampton, and can you imagine what it's like for them when they heard the news of the disaster? And once again, I'm getting ahead of myself. And then, of course, you know, prior to Titanic's departure, there was actually a lightboat drill that was actually conducted by the British Board of Trade earlier in the morning, so that way they know what to do. The man supervising the lowering of the lifeboats was actually Charles Lightoller, who would actually be a first officer at that time frame, before Chief Officer Henry Wilde jumped on board. He said that all the boats on the ship were swung out and those that required were lowered down as far as he actually wanted them. Some all the way went down and some even dropped in the water as well. And he accredited about six of them were lowered down part of the way. There was a call strike that was actually resolved on the six whatsoever and why Starline tried to work out with the other ships to transfer their call to the Titanic. And it worked out in favor since Titanic is under booked and is on its maiden voyage whatsoever. At 9 a.m., passengers started to arrive to board the Titanic. Third-class passengers were undergoing health inspections to make sure they do not bring in any diseases with them to the United States of America. If they do happen to have diseases, they will be denied entry to board the Titanic. As the last of the passengers boarded the Titanic at 12 p.m., Titanic sounded its whistles and tugboats pulled the ship away from the dock and fired up its main engines for the ship's maiden voyage. 
The ship carried 2,224 passengers on board. So as the Titanic was pulling out of the Southampton Harbor, a near disaster happened as the, it almost struck the Titanic. From the crew and the passengers on board, they were waving to their friends and family as the ship was pulling out of the harbor. So they heard these three recession snaps and no one knew what happened. It was just basically snap, snap, snap. So basically, they don't know what's going on. Was somebody shooting at them? You know, no one knows. Was someone firing a gun at them? And when they ran to the source of the snaps, something dramatic happened. The source of the snapping sounds came from the moors line of this ship, the SS City of New York, which is docked beside the RMS Titanic breaking off and snapping. Now, for those that don't know what mooring lines are, mooring lines are giant ropes that hold a vessel in place to a dock or a pier. So what actually did happen was, as the Titanic was leaving the Southampton dock, the powerful suction created by the engines were enough to break the mooring lines holding the New York to the pier, which actually caused the ship to be sucked towards the stern of the Titanic, which threatens a collision, kind of similar in the fashion of the HMS Hawk and the RMS Olympic. Due to the quick thinking actions by Captain Smith and several tugboats in the area, they were able to avoid a collision barely by a hair. And if you think about it, if this actually did were to happen, there would be a good chance that the Titanic would never hit the iceberg whatsoever. And all this is going to depend on the severity of the damage or the repairs whatsoever. Then that iceberg would just basically just completely drift south whatsoever and Titanic would never hit it. Then inspections were actually carried out, and it turns out there was actually no damage to the ship whatsoever, but it was only just a scare anyway. The departure was actually delayed by a half hour, and once that, those inspections were actually carried out and done, Titanic fired up its engines once again and proceeded to Cherbourg, France. At 6.30pm on the very same day, the Titanic arrived at Cherbourg, France to pick up more passengers, and when arriving, the Titanic is actually way too big to pull up to the dock in Cherbourg, so therefore, two tender ships were actually sent out. One name is the Nomadic, and the other is named the Traffic to drop off passengers or cargo to the Titanic. 24 of the Titanic's passengers disembarked at Cherbourg, while some more actually did board on the Titanic. Some notable names actually included Margaret Brown, Major Archibald Butt, Francis Millet, Joseph LaRoche and his wife, John Jacob Astor IV and his wife Madeline, and the Thayer family. A very interesting fact whatsoever is when Titanic was actually docked in Cherbourg, a priest by the name of Francis Brown took a photo of Titanic passenger Douglas Spedden, who was actually playing with a spinning top with his father and two other men. James Cameron actually used this photograph as a reference as Jack Dawson sneaks up his way to the boat deck in the first class area. While still in Cherbourg, 21 of those who embarked at Cherbourg were French, while the rest were from America, England, Belgium, Canada, Croatia, Greece, Italy, Lebanon, Poland, Russia, Syria, and Uruguay. However, there is actually some luxury French products, including champagne, wine, and cheese, were also transferred to the Titanic at port. Then, at 8.10 p.m., Titanic finally departed for Queenstown, Ireland, which is now present-day Cove, with SS Nomadic's crew shouting farewells, saying, See you in 15 days. Tune in tomorrow when Titanic finally arrives in Queenstown. Where we previously left off, the RMS Titanic left Southampton on her maiden voyage. Along the way, she almost had a near collision with the SS City of New York, thus therefore her leave-in was delayed by a half hour. Then later that night, she would arrive at Cherbourg, France. She would stay for a few hours to pick up more passengers and more mail from the tender ships, the Nomadic, and the Traffic. Once she finally stayed for a few hours, she then raised anchor and set sail to Queenstown, Ireland, her final stop before sailing to New York. Today, it is April 11, 2024, 112 years ago today, the RMS Titanic made her final stop at the town of Queenstown, Ireland, which is now present-day Cove, pick up and drop off more passengers. Now, in this part whatsoever, I'm actually going to cover her sea days from April 11th all the way before the iceberg collision on April 14th of 1912. So this is basically going to be one huge part, 
So that way you can get a lot of information instead of me having to do individual videos of per days. So that way this video is much more longer, it's much more better. That way there's a lot of information in there that I'm actually going to share with you guys. So we're going to get started and also if you happen to like this Titanic documentary, feel free to subscribe for more ship documentaries like this. I am planning on making some in the future especially with the first week of May, which is going to be the RMS Lusitania. So feel free to check that one out. And also another one, maybe a mini one at the end of May, which is going to be the Empress of Ireland. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started with this Titanic documentary. It is April 11th of 1912, 112 years ago, like I said in the beginning, that the RMS Titanic arrived at Queenstown, Ireland to pick up most third-class passengers, and also some passengers actually disembarked, to which that we will cover later on. So while docked at Queenstown, now what they actually did, they rather pull up out in the water and rather prefer to let the two tender ships instead of basically, you know, just waste a lot of time trying to get the Titanic into Queenstown port. So basically, instead, they actually decided to send out two tender ships, which is the Ireland and the America and both are paddle steamers. Now while docked it is an overcast day and what the passengers did not know prior before going to Queenstown Ireland is that the Titanic did these big sweeping maneuvers which is basically the helmsman basically testing out the maneuverability and it can actually be seen in this photo from Francis Brown whatsoever on board the RMS Titanic. Titanic arrived at Queenstown Ireland at Roche's Point Outer Anchorage which is now called Cove Ireland. Tenders, Pal Steamer, Ireland, and America were waiting in the dock to transport 123 passengers on board, mostly were third-class passengers, and they too had to go through health inspections to make sure they also go into America disease-free. While I'm actually not going to cover the Pal Steamers, I have narrated a video in the past about these two, and I will either leave a card or a link down in the description box below to check them out. So next to the attenders, there were actually a few smaller vessels that actually carried vendors, set sail, actually to meet the Titanic offshore. They're basically, you know, selling local specialties, such as lace and crafts to the wealthy first-class passengers. And since the Titanic is actually a Royal Mail ship or a Royal Mail steamer, the ship is actually contracted to take on bags of mail, which is heading all to North America whatsoever. So while at anchor, seven passengers actually disembarked. A notable one is actually Francis Brown, who actually got off as on the ship as the ship was actually anchored at Queenstown, Ireland. The reason why that he did this is because he befriended a American billionaire couple on board the RMS Titanic and basically sent a telegram to his supervisor saying, hey, can I spend time with this American billionaire couple. They're actually going to pay for me to go back to Ireland. So his superior actually told him to get off that ship. And little he knew, he was right. The last few photographs that you see of the RMS Titan came from Francis Brown as he was disembarking from one of the tender ships. He also took the last known photograph of Captain Smith alive, looking down from the starboard bridge wing of the Titanic. And along with those departed, there was an unexpected departure of a crewman by the name of John Coffey, who is a fireman and is actually a native of Queenstown, Ireland, who deserted the ship. So basically, he just signed on to the Titanic and decided to have a free passage all the way to Queenstown, Ireland and basically disembark from there. At 1.30 p.m., Titanic exchanged whistles with the tenders to return to the dock and Titanic finally raised anchor to the strains of Aaron's Lament, which is played by Eugene Daly, and set off for his first transatlantic voyage. Francis Brown or the Odell family, who is also another group that actually disembarked from the Titanic, took the last known photographs of the Titanic. Now, I'm actually going to do a video about the amateur photographers of the Titanic, because you have to remember, Titanic is not a very documented ship. So basically, everything that you see in books and everything, they basically came from the RMS Olympic. Just as Titanic was leaving Queenstown, Ireland, there's another ship that's going to be mentioned in this part, but we'll actually mention it a little bit later on. It's the RMS Carpathia, a Cunard liner left from New York to Fiume, Austria, Hungary, which is now present-day Rijeka, Croatia, under the command of Captain Arthur Rostrum. At this time, the ship was carrying 240 crew members, a quarter of the crew were actually Croatian sailors, 128 first-class passengers, 50 second class passengers, and 565 third class passengers. 
Little they knew, they were going to be a part of history forever. And also, a lighthearted event as well, Jack Phillips celebrates his 25th birthday on board the RMS Titanic. The two men you see in this photo is Jack Phillips and Harold Bride. Both are Marconi operators on board the RMS Titanic. While en route to Queenstown, Ireland, Harold Bride decides to surprise Jack Phillips for his 25th birthday on board the RMS Titanic. By the next afternoon, we were steaming west from the coast of Ireland, with nothing out ahead of us but ocean. It is now April 12th of 1912. 112 years ago today, the RMS Titanic was out at sea for her first time. And let me tell you one thing, when you first heard this line from the 1997 movie from Gloria Stewart, you know this ship is now out at sea for the first time. Passengers and crew were starting to get acquainted and accustomed to the ship, you know, different routines and everything. Now, around this time frame, the weather is actually very, very comfortable, which is about 60 degrees during noontime whatsoever. And there was actually a cold front that was from the west and north of the ship whatsoever. Now, you have to keep this in mind, though. Titanic wasn't actually going for a speed record of any kind whatsoever. In fact... The last boiler room, which is boiler room number one, which is right around back here, wasn't even lit. So boiler room one wasn't actually turned on for any reason whatsoever, especially during the sinking whatsoever. Titanic would receive its first ice warning from a ship named the La Touraine. This letter is actually addressed to Captain Smith, thus congratulating him on his new command and added on a, oh, here's some ice at this area. The message was handed to Captain Smith. And even though it didn't cause any alarm whatsoever since ice is common in early spring, the position of the reported ice is given to 4th Officer Joseph Boxhall and marked the position on the map in the chart room. So another notable event actually did happen on board the ship. It's actually regarding to the ship's designer, Thomas Andrews. You see, since Thomas Andrews is from Ireland, he had to leave his wife and daughter behind because he had to work on board the Titanic, you know, figure out any, everything, you know, from tr troubleshooting and then finding out, you know, whether to do improvements. Like, if you ever seen Titanic and you, you notice he has a little black notebook, yep, that's basically his uh, notes and everything, you know, thinking what he can do to improve the ship. So, yeah, Thomas Andrews is basically from Ireland, and basically he has to work by traveling on board the RMS Titanic, and he tends to be homesick, as we all understand that. So, our good friend Charles Yalkin actually did a good favor for him was baking Mr. Andrews some Irish soda bread and delivered it to his cabin and this story is actually never heard on board the RMS Titanic whatsoever so and that's a very very light-hearted event that actually did happen on board the ship as well so also Mr. Ismay actually did have some friends over in his stateroom and there was also a dinner party that actually did happen in the uh, first class wow not lounge of restaurant whatsoever or the dining room so basically everything seems ordinary whatsoever on this day 112 years ago on april 13 1912 it's considered one of the most eventful days on board the rms titanic the first note is that titanic is actually making a lot of progress whatsoever and the crew and the passengers actually did notice that the titanic might get to new york earlier than expected. Now, voyages are actually marked with light ships whatsoever. You got one in Southampton and you got one in New York City whatsoever. You pass one in Southampton, your voyage starts. You pass it in New York, guess what? It's over. Or vice versa, like if you pass the first light ship in New York, voyage begins, pass it in Southampton, it ends. Another notable thing that we have to remember that deep inside the Titanic's boiler rooms, there has been a coal fire that has been burning in boiler room number six. Now, coal fires are very common in steamships, and the way to handle it is to shovel out the coal and move it alongside. The unburned coal is moved to the port side coal bunker, and this actually influenced the trim of the Titanic. So much coal that was actually moved that she actually has a three degrees list to port. So a few passengers actually did notice the effect on the ship's list whatsoever. There was a passenger by the name of Irene Harris, and as she was actually walking down the grand staircase whatsoever, she was actually on her way to the reading and writing room, which... I actually did found, you know, ship's plans, and basically there was a map that actually told me, okay, she was heading to the, the reading and writing room. The grand staircase floor actually has a linoleum tile, and 
very shiny, very expensive at the time frame, and all of it could be located in the first class area for the grand staircase. And as she was actually walk, walking down the stairs, she actually did not notice that the ship's list actually had a little effect whatsoever. So basically it's about two, three degrees to port, slightly noticeable by others. So as she was actually walking down, she actually lost her footing and then actually tumbled and broke her arm. So she was taken to the ship's doctor and she actually got patched up and went back to dinner for in the first class dining room whatsoever. And also as the Titanic was sailing on, passengers like to send, you know, loved ones and friends back home on um, via telegram so you know how the ship is doing, how the ship's performing. So there's two men named Jack Phillips and Harold Bride. They were actually working on sending out private messages for the passengers. And so the what they would work is they would actually do send out the telegrams, but also inform the crew and the captain of any ice within the route that they are taking. Phillips was on his ship when he was having issues with the wireless machine. After 11 p.m., the apparatus broke down and Phillips tried to troubleshoot the issue, you know, trying to find out what the cause was. He finally woke up Bride, who was asleep in the wireless cabin, and decided to find a solution to fix the machine. However, doing so actually has two things. One, it's a violation of company policy, and two, had they not repaired the machine, the sinking of the Titanic would actually have huge repercussions whatsoever. So unfortunately, in the Marconi wireless company's policy, should an apparatus actually do break down, the operator should not attempt to fix it whatsoever until the vessel reaches dry land and a certified technician boards the ship to start the apparatus. So the problem is with this apparatus is that the leaves for the secondary of the transformer actually burnt through the casing and actually damaged some of the iron bolts. So Phil's attempted to fix it with rubber tape and it actually worked whatsoever. So at 5.30 a.m. ship's time on April 14th, 1912, the machine is actually back up and running again. But unfortunately, there's actually a huge backlog of messages that had to be sent. Now think about this for a second. If that apparatus were to remain down throughout the whole duration of the sinking, more lives would have been lost. It is on this day, April 14th, 1912, 112 years ago today. This is a day that many of us actually know is one of the most infamous encounters, but we're actually going to get to that a little bit later on. So what we're going to do, we're going to look through the events that actually led up through the night. Now keep this in mind though, whatsoever, there is new information in this part that actually did surface. So we're actually going to look into it. So that's the reason why I actually do want to cover this part first. And then we get into the uh, encounter with the iceberg. Now, the first of all that you need to remember is that the Titanic's engines are now recorded up to 75 RPMs and actually reach a top speed of 22 knots, which is very, very good whatsoever. Now, another thing that we have to remember is separating fact from what we actually believe in. Now, as we all know, Titanic was originally supposed to have a lifeboat drill on that day on Sunday, April 14, 1912, as it is very religiously for Captain Smith to do that. And what we used to believe is that the captain actually canceled it due to Sunday services, but that is actually not the case whatsoever. However, a testimony was actually came up. A couple of friends of mine actually shared it to me whatsoever. It's from one of the lookouts from the Titanic. His name is Archie Jewell actually did shed some light on why this lifeboat drill was actually canceled whatsoever. There is a video from this channel. Now, I collabed with a lot of different narrators, and it was actually a lot of fun, too. I actually got to uh, portray myself as Senator Smith in this video, so do feel free to check it out. I will leave a card at the top corner of your screen. The man you see in this photo is Archie Jewell. He is one of the six surviving lookouts to the sinking of the RMS Titanic and also a survivor of the sinking of the HMHS Britannic. He testified in the British Red Commissioner's inquiry about why the lifeboat drill was canceled. He stated that it was due to strong wind and rain that occurred on the dawn of April 14, 1912. So the strong wind was actually blowing hard, thus the reason why the lifeboat drill was actually canceled in the first place. Now, can you imagine trying to lower a lifeboat with strong winds. It'd be very dangerous. I could see why it was canceled. So the reason of this cancellation was actually told to all crew members whatsoever. 
So there were actually some speculation, you know, that the captain told his close crew members and also the six lookouts as well. So basically everyone else just kind of, you know, received word of it. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, back to work that we go. Now Sunday services were actually held throughout the ship whatsoever. So first class actually have service in the first class dining room, which is right around down here. To which they actually did sing hymns that ironically, one would actually be Eternal Father, Strong to Save. Which actually then did end it with the ironic lyrics of For Those in Peril on the Sea Whatsoever. Did you know the infamous I'm Flying scene from the 1997 Titanic movie? Well, if you do, it's one of the most recognizable moments in cinema history. But did you know that this scene is a reference to a real life passenger who visited the Vauxhall deck on the ship? Yes, that's actually very true. The lady you see in this photo is Helen Candy. She is an American author, journalist, decorator, feminist, and geographer. She's best known as a survivor, and her later work as a travel writer and an explorer of Southeast Asia. She's traveling on the Titanic after she received a telegram from her daughter, Edith, advising that her son, Harold, has been injured in an accident. And for those who don't know what a Vauxhall deck is, it's the upper deck of a sailing ship towards the foremast, and this is where the front section of the ship. Titanic had heavy machinery, such as the anchor crane, the giant anchor chains that we see on the wreck today, and the third anchor at the near prow of the ship. There are signs that are placed around warning passengers that the area is off limits and very dangerous. So at 1.42 p.m., Captain Smith actually received a telegram from the SS Baltic saying that there's an icebergs and large quantities of field ice. So, unfortunately, that one's actually taken by Mr. Isney, who actually did show it off to passengers whatsoever. So we're going to actually get to that rule soon later on. So, and then at 5 p.m., Titanic actually did report it at a location called The Corner. If you don't know what The Corner is, this is located at 42 degrees north and 47 degrees west. But when Captain Smith actually changed course, it actually led the Titanic to travel through a very, very known ice field. And by 5.50 p.m., that turn was actually from south 62 degrees to south 86 degrees west whatsoever, which is actually heading north-south about 71 degrees west. At 6 p.m., 2nd Officer Charles Lytler actually began his watch on board the Titanic, where he actually did remain for four hours even though when he had his dinner. So a handful of the officers were actually aware of the weather and the telegrams of the ice warnings. Now, he did a radio interview on BBC called I Was There in 1936. And I'm going to play an audio from that on that night of April the 14th, we all, that is, the captain and officers, knew perfectly well that we were just about entering the region where ice might be sighted at that particular time of the year, and had taken all necessary precautions. So at 7 p.m., the temperature actually did drop from 43 degrees to 33 degrees, and this was actually very noticeable by the passengers. Now, think about this. April 14th is one of the very most unusual times out in the North Atlantic Ocean because you have to remember this is reported as clear and calm basically the water is just basically flat you know you would think of you know a couple of rogue waves here and there or some waves that's not the case in this time this is actually one of the most darkest days of all time in the year so first class passengers you know they begin to have their dinner Bruce Ismay, who actually did still have the ice warning from the SS Baltic in his pocket throughout the day, he was actually reported in the first class smoking room where Captain Smith actually asked for the telegram from the Baltic back so that way it could be posted in the chart room whatsoever. Ismay actually did comply, gave the captain back the telegram, and actually did all that before actually serving dinner in the Alicardi restaurant, but they were both sitting at separate tables, so... Basically, this dinner right here for Captain Smith, it was basically a celebration for him. Basically, presumably retiring, to which it's not the case whatsoever. And my lights turned off, if you didn't see. Before 9 p.m., Captain Smith returned to the bridge following his meal where he was met with Charles Lightheart and 6th Officer James Moody. When the captain returned to the bridge, there were many stars in the night sky, but the Titanic was sailing on a calm, moonless night. At 9.20, Smith left the bridge only to give 2nd Officer Charles Lightoller these instructions, if in the slightest degree doubtful, let me know. Minutes later, Moody telephoned the crow's nest and asked to look out for small ice. Then at 10 p.m., 
Whiteller was relieved by first officer William Murdoch, and at the same time, Archie Jewell and George Simons were relieved by Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee. So between the times of 9.20 p.m. to 10 p.m., Jack Phillips was actually working on a backlog of messages to send to Cape Race whatsoever. Now, Cape Race is about 400 miles from the Titanic, so you have to think about this. Jack Phillips can only hear the faint dots and dashes, so he had to turn up the, uh, the volume so that way he could be able to hear those faint dots and dashes. So he responded to a message from a steamship called the SS Mezaba, who actually delivered an ice report where the crew actually did say they saw heavy pack ice, large bergs, and field ice. But unfortunately, this message was actually never delivered whatsoever. It was very critical. It actually did came at 9.52 p.m. And what happened with Jack Phillips led him to snap after listening to the SS Californian because of this incident with the Marconi apparatus the night before. Keep in mind that Jack Phillips had little sleep. While Phillips was listening to a telegram message for a first-class passenger by the name of Dorothy Gibson from Cape Race at 10.55 p.m., Cyril Evans, the only operator on the Californian, sends a message to Phillips saying, Say, old man, we are stopped and surrounded by ice. This message was so strong that it came and a loud ring in Phillips' ear. The reason is the California signal was so close to the Titanic, and you had to keep this in mind, the closer you are, the louder you'll hear the messages. And also another factor is that Titanic and California are using a spark gap wireless sets. Phillips had the volume on his apparatus up so he can hear the faint dots and dashes of Morse code from Cape Race. So this caused Jack Phillips to snap back by messaging Evans, I am busy, I am working Cape Race, you are jamming my signal. Now the popular contrary of Jack Phillips, you know, telling the Californian to keep out and shut up was actually very, very blown out of proportion whatsoever. And you have to think about this. Jack Phillips stayed up nearly 24 hours, you know, because the apparatus went down, he and Jack Phillips, he and Harold Bright had to fix it. So don't take what I say out of context whatsoever. You know, I get that frustration. You know, he got agitated. So basically, it was not very appropriate of him doing that whatsoever. He would have taken it in, you know, into consideration. The Phillips would actually do apologize to Cape Race and actually ask for Dorothy's, Dorothy Gibson's message again whatsoever. Afterwards, Evans on the Californian turned in for the night and shut down the Californian's apparatus, considering he is the only operator on board the vessel. And from here, this is where the turning point of maritime history would take place. As we come up at 11.39 p.m., Reginald Lee and Frederick Fleet spotted a large mass of ice directly in the path of the Titanic. As the Titanic gracefully sails across the icy waters of the North Atlantic, anticipation fills the air. Passengers revel in the luxury and grandeur of the ship, each with their own dreams and aspirations for the journey ahead. Meanwhile, deep within the heart of the vessel, the crew diligently tends to their duties, ensuing the smooth operation of this marvel of engineering. But beneath the surface of this idyllic scene lies a brewing sense of foreboding, Unbeknownst to those on board, the Titanic hurtled towards its fatal encounter with destiny, a collision with an iceberg that will forever alter the course of history. As we pick up the narrative before the iceberg's collision, we delve into the bustling life on board the ship, from the lavish restaurants and dining rooms to the bustling engine rooms. We witness the intricate tapestry of human experiences that defy this legendary voyage. Join us as we journey deeper into the heart of the Titanic, Exploring the untold stories of those who walked its decks and the events that led to that fateful night of April 14, 1912. It is now April 14, 1912. Titanic was steaming through a region known for ice. The ship was actually reaching near top speed. The, meth the time is now 11 o'clock p.m. Ship's time. By now, the passengers of the Titanic are now mostly asleep on board, but a few of the passengers actually are drinking coffee or hot tea in the Alicardi restaurant. And some are actually, you know, straggling around. Up high in the crow's nest are Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee, both crew members of the RMS Titanic. An hour ago, they both relieved lookouts George Simons and Archie Jewell. Both gave the men specific instructions to look out for ice. The weather is calm, 
cold as the temperature dropped to 31 degrees. The sea is flat, calm, starry night with no moon, and a slight haze in front. For those that don't know what a crow's nest is, a crow's nest is a shelter or a platform fixed near the top of a mass of a vessel as a place for a lookout to stand. Keep in mind, this is pre-radar at the time frame. Now, the haze is actually created by a cold water mirage. This is likely what happened when there's cold air air below warmer air, and this type can make objects look like they're floating up in the sky and causing light paths in between the boundary of the two to be bent dramatically, distorting how an object appears. Now, would binoculars actually work in this case whatsoever? Well, unfortunately, no. As we all know, and we actually discussed this earlier in the earlier part of this documentary, was this, you had to keep this in mind, though. There was a reshuffle of bridge officers on the RMS Titanic prior to the maiden voyage, to which David Blair, who was actually the original second officer on board the Titanic, when Captain Smith actually brought on Chief Officer Henry Wilde from the RMS Olympic, this actually bumped David Blair off the roster and therefore he left the ship. So Blair actually took the key that was actually meant for a locker to which the binoculars were actually stored in. Now, whether would these binoculars are useful or not, it wouldn't matter anyway whatsoever. Because if you're going to look through out there in the Atlantic Ocean, all you're going to see is total darkness. Now, they could be useful if it was light outside, but since it's at night, all you're going to see is very total darkness whatsoever. Then, at 11.39 p.m., Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee spotted a dark mass of ice directly in their way. And when it came closer, it horrified them and realized it was an iceberg. Fleet rang the bell three times. Fuck me! Is there anyone there? Yes, what do you see? Iceberg, right ahead! Thank you. First Officer William Murdoch was on duty that night and already commanded the helmsman, Robert Hickens, to turn hard to starboard, which basically means turn the ship to port whatsoever. He would throw the reciprocating engines in reverse, but the forward momentum of the ship actually still carried the Titanic forward. Now, if you think about this, it looked like they were going to avoid a huge head-on collision. Down in the boiler in the engine rooms, men were scrambling to drop the steam pressure as a red light is emitted in boiler room number 6, signalizing to stop. Upon seeing this, Frederick Fleet ordered the men to shut off airflow to the boilers, and now the Titanic is adrift with the reversing engines. However, with very effort, it looked like Titanic might miss a head-on collision, but unfortunately, the danger part of the iceberg is not up at the top, it's mostly under the water. 10% you can actually see, but the 90% you cannot. Then the inevitable happened. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic strikes the iceberg. As the Titanic bumped along, the seams start buckling and the rivets were popped, allowing in seawater from the outside. The worst damage came in boiler room number 6 as water poured into the boiler room, and a hard pour order is also given out to clear the ship's propellers from getting damaged by the iceberg. From the bridge, William Murdoch already turned the switch on to close off the watertight compartment doors, sealing off the water inside the ship, and right away, Captain Smith is already up on the bridge as he felt the collision. And he immediately asked what happened, as Murdoch stated it was an iceberg. Now, depending on where you're at on the ship whatsoever, if you're anywhere within the bow section up here, you would definitely feel something, especially if you're a fireman off-duty or basically a third-class passenger you would definitely feel that rumble up here. But if you actually happen to be somewhere back here, it's going to sound like basically a freight train pulling into the station. So basically all you're going to do is basically feel some slight shaking whatsoever. Jack Thayer noted this when he, he saw his glass of water shaking as he was asleep in his room. The rest who were actually still awake would actually notice, you know, the chandeliers are shaking. The damage of the iceberg actually extended from... The four-peak tank, which is right up here, up front, all the way aft to the first funnel. Puncturing a small gash in the four coal bunker for boiler room number five. So crew and surviving third-class passengers who bunked in the forward areas of the Titanic did definitely felt something like a violent crash whatsoever. Captain Smith ordered the engines to stop, so it would be the last time the Titanic engines would ever operate on board the ship. The most notable sound throughout the voyage is the heartbeat of the reciprocating engines working 
Once that is stopped, passengers actually took notice of this unusual silence and asked what happened. Lars Beasley, who is a second-class passenger and later author of The Loss of the SS Titanic, happened to notice the silence in his book and said that is, and that is was the first hint of anything out of the ordinary had happened. From where the Titanic has stopped is true north-northwest, 400 miles off the southern coast of Newfoundland, and it's going to be that way for eternity. Immediately afterwards, safety valves were actually open to relieve the steam pressure of the Titanic was actually building up inside. So you have to remember, Titanic was running on full, nearly full pressure of steam, and it would have continued and therefore caused a boiler explosion. So what do you do with this steam? You basically have one pipe here and another one right here. And once this steam is actually built up so built up to the point to where it has to go out through the safety valves. Somebody would have to flip the safety valve and basically let all that steam out. The steam was actually venting out so loud that it was actually very hard to communicate with one another on the boat deck. So it's going to be a lot of noise whatsoever. So this basically went on until the steam actually stopped. And this basically, the steam actually did stop when the tire... Titanic officers had to lower passengers off into the boats whatsoever, but we're going to get to that in the next part whatsoever. And in this animation by Titanic Honor and Glory, you can hear the steam venting out, and for animation's sake, it's not as loud, but if you were anywhere on the boat deck, it would be deafening loud. Think of it as a tea kettle on a hot stove with water and tea in it. Crew members reported that the uh, noise was deafening. Fourth Officer Boxhall started his own investigation as he descended down. He received a report from a carpenter saying that the four-peak hatch was blown off and the number one tarpaulin is ballooning up. Another report also came in from a mail clerk saying that the mail room is filling up and we went to see as bags of mail were floating around. It appeared the Titanic's in trouble. Now you're thinking to yourself, what is the four-peak tank? Well, the four-peak tank is actually the very first front compartment up here. But however, that compartment is actually below it. So basically that's a watertight area. But the top part of that area is basically not sealed. And then of course you got the, the three forward compartments. Which is up here where my fingers are respectively. You also have boiler room number six. Which is right here where my ring finger is. And also there's a tiny gash into coal bunker number five. The four most one. However, the Titanic can survive any collision. With the first four watertight compartments breach or two back here or any two up here but how unfortunately the iceberg opened up the seams from the four peak tank to aft of the first funnel and titanic is basically doomed and this ship cannot stay afloat with the first five compartments breach five compartments is basically let's put it that a very unsurvivable condition as the Titanic collides with the unforgiving force of the iceberg, the reverberations of the impact echo throughout the ship. Panic ensues as passengers and crew alike grapple with the sudden realization of the impending danger. In the blink of an eye, the grandeur of the Titanic gives way to chaos and uncertainty. As the night unfolds and the Titanic begins its descent into the icy depths of the North Atlantic, the true magnitude of the tragedy becomes apparent. Amidst the chaos, act of heroism, and selflessness emerge, as individuals strive to save themselves and others from the icy embrace of the sea. As we transition to April 15, 1912, the sinking of the Titanic is underway in full force. We find ourselves amidst a scene of unimaginable despair and heartbreak. As the ship, once unsinkable ship, succumbs to the relentless force of the nature, join us as we bear witness to the harrowing events of the fateful night honoring the courage and resilience of those who face the ultimate test of survival aboard the Titanic. As we look back on the events of April 14, 1912, we witness the serene majesty of the Titanic's voyage marred by the chilling encounter with an iceberg. The collision, occurring at 11.40 p.m., shattered the illusion of invincibility surrounding the magnificent vessel. Panic and confusion swept through the decks as passengers and crew grappled with a sudden shift from opulence to impending peril. 
As we transition into the early morning hours of April 15, 1912, the sinking of the Titanic enters its first hour. Amidst the chaos and darkness, the ship's distress signals pierce the night sky, pleading for aid in the vast expanse of the North Atlantic. Lifeboats are being lowered into the frigid waters, with their capacity woefully inadequate for the sheer number of souls on board. Despite the valiant efforts of the crew to maintain order, fear and desperation grips the hearts of those on board as the icy waters rise higher. In the face of impending tra tragedy, acts of courage and compassion emerge amidst the chaos, illuminating the human spirit resilience in the face of adversity. As the clock inches towards 1 a.m., the full scale of the disaster becomes painfully clear. Join us as we bear witness to the unfolding tragedy, honoring the memory of those who face the ultimate test of survival amidst the icy depths of the North Atlantic Ocean. Today, 112 years ago, the Titanic is doomed to sink. 20 minutes ago, the ship struck an iceberg at 11.48 p.m. on April 14, 1912, compromised at five of the major watertight compartments and a tear into the four coal bunker for boiler room number five. Titanic has stopped true north-northwest, 400 miles south from the coast of Newfoundland. All right, so in this part, we're actually going to divide it into three separate parts. The first hour, the second hour, and of course, the final 20 minutes and the rescue from the Carpathia, and also the trip back to New York as well. While we're not going to cover all of the events that actually did happen, we're actually going to cover some of the major ones that actually did occur as the ship was sinking. A character that we previously talked about in the last video is a man by the name of 4th Officer Joseph Boxhall who carried out his own inspection. He knows he couldn't get into the mail room, boiler room 6, or the cargo holds. He immediately reported back to the captain to notify him that the damage is worse, that any possibility of the iceberg causing minimal damage had gone out the window. Once Smith received word from Boxhall, he ordered him to wake up the remaining off-duty officers and Mooney got with some crew to get him aft port lifeboat set up. Thomas Andrews conducted his own inspection and conducted mathematical guesses. He went down below to inspect the damage via working stairs. As passengers were woken up, they were already told to put on warm clothes and come up onto the boat deck with their life jackets on. Majority of the first class were already roused up because of their slumber was interrupted and they stayed in warm public spaces. Now Captain Smith actually ordered lifeboats to be swung out and ready in case of evacuation, but doing so in a noisy environment is actually proven difficult as crew members had to get close to one another and had to yell at the top of their lungs to ask someone. Now the best way I can actually do describe this is from the 1997 Titanic film during the prepping of the lifeboats. Now I'm going to play a scene from that movie and note to headphone users, this scene is going to be incredibly loud so just want to take this opportunity right now to turn down your headphones because I am not responsible for the loss of hearing that's going to come up. So, in three, two, one. <laughs> Alright, now listen to me. The ship has been seriously damaged. The captain's ordered the boat swung up. It's got to be done quickly. Yeah, so that actually proves how difficult it is for the crew to communicate with one another out on the boat deck. Now, there was this documentary I actually did watch called Titanic 25 Years Later with James Cameron. There was an experiment that was actually tested with a replica of a lifeboat complete with the data cranes to see how long it takes for the lifeboat to be set up. Now, it actually did took 8 minutes and 30 seconds to get the boat set up and lowered to the edge of the boat deck, then an additional 10 minutes just for loading. It also took two minutes to go to 10 feet. It also take an additional 40 more and eight minutes to go down to the water, which actually results in 30 minutes and 27 seconds. Now keep this in mind though, if the lifeboats were loaded all the way up and down the whole boat deck, they wouldn't be able to get all of them off in time. They were actually lucky to get the last two floated off, but that's gonna be another video until later on. So as the passengers were actually still roused up, you know, the ship's orchestra was actually led by Wallace Hartley actually began to play a variety of music from waltzes to marches to cheer up passengers that kept everyone calm. But there wasn't actually much calm going on in the second class promenade as a second class pastor by the name of Charlotte Collier said there was a great number of passengers gathered 
at the second class promenade as officers were shouting that there's no danger. The Thomas Andrews came up from below and he had this look of worry because Titanic is his ship, this is his girl, he knows that she is in trouble. So he went to inform Captain Smith saying, yep, yeah, we're done, this ship's got an hour. But with that, Captain Smith actually ordered the crew to begin loading and launching lifeboats as the evacuation of the Titanic now fully begins. At 12.27 a.m., Jack Phillips transmits out Titanic's first CQD distress call. The problem is that Captain Smith gave out the wrong coordinates to try to find out where you're at in the middle of the ocean. Using the stars is very difficult. Since there is a lot of math to it, to which we will not go over in this video, the first ship to receive Titanic's first CQD distress call was from the German ship to Frankfurt. They asked what the matter with the Titanic was, and since the Frankfurt is German, there's an operator and a translator on board. Now keep this in mind though, there is a language barrier. More ships that also received the CQD distress calls from the Mount Temple, for whom they cannot hear due to the noise of steam, Cape Race, to which Jack Phillips has been communicating with all night, Yaparanga, and finally the Carpathia. But there's going to be a lot more that will come on, like the RMS Olympic. Boxhaw also came into the wireless room to provide updated coordinates since their position is off. Now, this ship we hadn't talked about since earlier in the documentary is the Carpathia. So, we haven't talked about that ship for quite a while. So, the last time I actually did mention this ship was back on April 11th as the ship left from, from New York City on a voyage to Austria Hungary. Now, this is where the ship comes into the story of the RMS Titanic. The man you see in this photo is Harold Cottam. He is a wireless operator to the RMS Carpathia on the night of the sinking of the Titanic. The story goes as he signed off for the night, and just like Bryson Phillips, he's a technical wizard himself. He went back to the wireless room to put on his headset to listen to any more incoming messages within the outside world. He receives transmission from a station in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and these messages were intended for the Titanic. And for the rest, well, I'll let this independent film called The Last Signals by HFX Studios explain the rest. I have another one. MPA, MPA. It's the Carpathia, the Carpathia. Do you know Cape Cod is sending a batch of... Holy hell! MGY, come at... Once we have struck a bug, it's a CQD, old man. Position 41, 44 north, 50, 24 west. Shall I tell my captain? Yes, come at once. So at this very same time, two events actually also did happen. One is the lowering of lifeboat number seven, and Harold Cotton tells Captain Arthur Rostrin, but getting to Captain Rostrin is not going to be that easy. You see, Cotton tells the officers of the watch that the Titanic is sinking, and at first the officers just kind of, you know, told him off, you know, saying that someone's pulling his leg, and, and yes, this is for context, there are trolls back in 1912, like what we have today on the internet. Basically, what operators would like to do is basically abuse the Marconi system to send out fake CQD distress calls for no reason whatsoever. However, Cottom was actually rebuttal, like, he wasn't gonna take no for an answer from the uh, officers and decided, you know what, I'm gonna bust through Captain Rostrand's room regardless if he was sleeping or not, and he did, and however, Rostron was actually furious with Cotton, you know, telling him off, you know, about not knocking first before entering because he is a captain, but once Rostron received that CQD distress call from the Titanic, he actually took it all in and, and discussed saying, okay, here's the coordinates, and let's turn the ship towards Titanic's position. However, it would actually take them about four hours for them to get to Titanic's position. And at that time, they will be gone. Back on the Titanic, the first lifeboat to be lowered away was lifeboat number seven. The boat only had a capacity of 28. It was built to handle 65. And at this time, it has nearly been an hour since the Titanic struck an iceberg and is currently sinking. No one knows the seriousness of the situation yet. 
At 12.40 a.m., Lifeboat 7 successfully touches the water. A man by the name of Archie Jewell is on this lifeboat and is one of the six lookouts that survived altogether. He would also survive the sinking of the HMHS Britannic later in life, but died five years and two days later on the SS Donegal during World War I. But that's a story for another time. Now, another thing I actually do want to go over is the women and children first rule. Now, at first, there were actually two conflicting orders that were actually given out. One was First Officer William Murdoch, who has been lowering life posts on the starboard side of the ship, actually took the order of women and children first. He did allow men on if there were room. Now, early on, he didn't allow any men on, but once it actually got closer and closer to the end, he actually didn't hesitate to let anyone in, of course. Charles Lightoller, however, the second officer who was in charge of the port side, actually took the order of women and children only, which means that if you're a male, you need to step aside, let the uh, women and children board only. So that's why there were actually half-filled lifeboats that were actually lowered in the ocean early on. At 12.45 a.m., Lifeboat 5 was the second lifeboat to be lowered under the command of 3rd Officer Herbert Pittman with a capacity of 36 out of 65, but this boat had some troubles during the lowering as one side went too low and had to stop. The problem was corrected and Lifeboat 5 was lowered safely into the water. A few minutes later, the first distress rocket is launched. Up on the boat deck, a panicking Ismay started grabbing the ropes to Lifeboat 5, yelling out, lower away, lower away. Fifth Officer Harold Lowe, who witnessed this, told him off by saying, if you will get the hell out of the way, I shall be able to do something. Then proceeding to ask him, do you want me to lower away quickly? And you will have me drown a whole lot of them. Harold Lowe's stern words actually remind Ismay that he is no position to tell the crew what to do as he is simply a passenger regardless if he is the chairman of the White Star Line. Now during the night Titanic actually fired up rockets at different intervals and each of them were actually in a different color ranging from blue to white to red. Now in maritime regulations to fire up rockets in a signal of distress you have to fire them off at one minute intervals. It doesn't matter which color it is it just the timing matters. The 1912 International Rules of the Road governing about the signals of distress are very clear whatsoever. Article 31 Class 1 calls for a cannon or explosive device with a report fired off at one minute intervals and Article 31 Class 3 cover the signal of distress which is a rock of any color fired one minute in short intervals. Well, sure that the Titanic was actually indeed firing rockets whatsoever, but not at the one minute intervals as the uh, rule suggested. At Lifeboat 8, the noise of the steam finally stopped as Charles Lightoller finally loaded up the port side lifeboats only with women and children. This area of the ship is notable due to two notable passengers, Isidore and Ida Strauss, both co-owners of the Macy's department store in New York City, who were up on the boat deck together. Isidore tells Ida to get into a lifeboat, but Ida refused to part ways with her husband. A man by the name of Hugh Wolner went up to talk to Isidore and let him know that they wouldn't mind if they took a spot in lifeboat 8. Isidore refused this offer and said that he would not board a lifeboat before the rest of the men, women, and children on the ship. Due to this testimony by Wolner, we know about this exchange that it did happen on board the ship. At 12.55 a.m., Lifeboat 3 is lowered away with 32 occupied seats built for 65, and at the same time, a second rocket is launched into the night sky. Bruce Ismay, who calmed down after a heated exchange with, after his little run-in with 5th Officer Harold Lowe and being scolded by him, he finally calmed down and already assisted passengers into Lifeboat number 3. Once they got that done, they moved aft towards Lifeboats 9, 11, 13, and 15. And at this very same time, Lifeboat 8 is lowered into the water as this boat already has an occupancy of 25 out of 65 seats. This is one of the few half-filled lifeboats that would be lowered into the ocean. And now with that first hour out of the way, the first hour and 20 minutes have now been covered. The next hour and 20 minutes is when the seriousness of the sinking of the Titanic really picks up. As the clock strikes 1 a.m., the Titanic's fate hangs in the balance. In the frigid waters of the North Atlantic, a battle between human resilience and the relentless force of nature unfolds. On board the Titanic, a somber calm sails over the remaining passengers and crew, their faces etched with a mixture of fear and resignation. 
In these darkest of hours, the true measure of human courage and compassion is put into the ultimate test. Amidst the chaos and despair, the acts of heroism emerge as individuals strive to comfort and support one another. But as the minutes slip by, the titanic strength wanes once her mighty form succumbing to the relentless pressure of the ocean depths. And then, in a moment that will echo through the annals of history, Titanic breaks apart, her hull fracturing under the immense strain. Join us as we bear witness to the final hour of the Titanic's journey, a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who sailed aboard her and the enduring legacy of one of history's greatest tragedies. It is now April 15th of 1912, 112 years ago today, the next hour of the Titanic turns into one of the most dramatic turns in history. So how did we get here, you may ask? Well, you can pause the video right here and actually go back to April 14th, 1912, part 2 with the iceberg collision and the previous part to April 15th, 1912, then actually do come back here. It is now 1 a.m. where we last left off as the lowering of Lifeboat 8, which is lowered around this time. This boat had an occupancy of 25 out of the 65 seats that are available. It is also around this time that the Turkish baths on F deck has started to flood. And possibly the biggest piece of advice I can actually give you right now if you're watching this, if you are ever on a sinking vessel, do not hang around in the interiors. Get out of the inside. Minutes later, Lightboat 1 is lowered with an occupancy of 12 out of 40 open seats. Only five passengers and seven crew members make up this boat. Once the boat touched the water, George Simons was ordered to row some yards away from the ship and then come back when ordered. Now, I have covered Lifeboat 1 in a video before, so do feel free to check that out. I will provide a link in the description box below or as a card up on the top corner of your screen. Now, do you remember when I mentioned the Olympic would actually appear later on? Well... She actually did, as she was actually on an eastbound voyage from New York to Southampton. Wireless operators Ernest James Moore or Alec Begat or whoever one of those two actually sent a service message, excuse me, from the Olympic to the Carpathia to the Titanic. So this is basically just a relay message. Basically the Carpathia is asking Titanic, hey, don't you hear the Olympic calling you? And Titanic's operator at the time frame is Jack Phillips. He actually couldn't hear the faint dots and dashes of Morse code from the Olympic was due to the, quote, rush of air and noise of steam, which is basically the steam venting out. The Olympic immediately asked who has struck an iceberg, and Titanic responded that it was them and also gave out their coordinates. Olympic received this, and it was relayed to Captain Herbert Haddock on the Olympic. In a few minutes, simultaneous transmissions started to go off, making communication hard to hear for Jack Phillips and the rest of the operators. Now, keep this in mind, though. Back then, there was no different radio channels and different radio frequencies like what we have with handheld walkie-talkies. Now these days, we go to one channel to communicate. If we need to communicate with another channel, we switch there. It took a while for the Olympic to tell all stations to stop talking and stop transmitting. Now, there is a video called Titanic in her own words that translates the dots and dashes of Morse code and translate it to English text and words. This will give you how chaotic the situation is. I will play a sample of that right about now. SOS, this is Titanic. This is Olympic. This is Titanic. This is Virginian. SOS, calling Titanic. CQD, this is Virginian. CQD, calling Titanic. This is Titanic. Cape Race to Virginia. SOS, report to your captain. SOS, the Titanic has struck iceberg and requires immediate assistance. Received. Olympic to Titanic. CQD. SOS, Olympic to Titanic. This is Titanic. Carpathia to Titanic. We have struck an iceberg and are sinking. We are coming your way. SOS, coming at full speed. CQD, doing 15 knots. Received. Frankfurt to Titanic. Position. We are coming to you for 1.46. Olympic to Titanic. 
Titanic to Olympic. We are in collision with the Berg. Sinking head down. Virginian calling Cape Race. 1.46 North. L Titanic. 50. We are going to her assistance. 14 West. We are 170 miles north. Come soon as possible. Olympic to all stations. Virginian calling Cape Race. Olympic to all stations. This is Baltic. Stop talking. This is Baltic. Stop talking. Stop transmitting. Jamming. All stations stop talking. Now, that actually does tell you how chaotic and very difficult for the Olympic to communicate with the Titanic. And I can't even imagine what it's like to hear all of those dots and dashes of Morse code from every which way of every ship, such as the Mount Temple, the Frankfurt, Virginian, and many more. You can actually do understand some of them, like Titanic and the Carpathia. Now, once everyone stopped communicating, they actually allowed the Olympic to talk to the Titanic. Jack Phillips actually did look like that he did succeed until Olympic did ask, are you steering southerly to meet us? And Jack Phillips had his key over, had his hand over the key and just stopped like, why is he not getting it? Well, how are they not getting it? And he angrily sends a message saying we are putting women off in the boats to which Olympic you know finally understood the situation of what's going on now as many of you know I always like to look at the wireless transcripts of April 15 up until the end of the sinking but now many times I've actually forgotten about the timeline itself so I kind of got a little bit of a head this one happened around 1 30 but I kind of got a little ahead of myself, so we're going to jump right back in the, in the previous half hour. At 1.05 a.m., Charles Lightoller ordered two men to go down to open up the D-deck gangway door on the port side. The problem is that this door is bigger than the iceberg damage that was inflicted onto the Titanic, and by opening this door, this allows water to enter in from a new way, but unfortunately, these men would never return whatsoever. Charles Lightoller had never seen them again or knew that the door was open. The location of where the D-Deck gangway door opens to is inside the first class reception room in the grand staircase, to which is a much bigger room. And next to the reception room, if you go further back, is the dining room. And again, this is a very much bigger spacious area for water to flow into. At 1.10 a.m., Lifeboat 6, under the command of Quartermaster Robert Hickens, is lowered with 23 occupied seats built for 65. This is one of the most infamous lifeboats to be lowered and is the most empty. During the lowering, Margaret Brown ordered to stop lowering the lifeboat, but unfortunately, the problem is that they have only one seaman on board. Charles Lightoller up on deck looked around to see if there was anyone available. A Canadian yachtsman by the name of Major Arthur Pukins offered to go down. Charles Lightoller allowed him to lower himself down. Along the way, he even dropped his wallet as well and would be there, discovered for by the Olaf. Of 80 years. Ready. Luckily, my good Far friend Sam from the story travels already covered the wallet story, to which you can it's so the dreadfully cold the tonight. The as How well. long must we sit in these boats? Now, it was around this time that the sinking of the Titanic took one of the most dramatic turns and the dramatic reaching points. The sinking actually did claim the first two casualties, Jonathan Shepard and Herbert Harvey. Now, throughout the sinking, the men, along with Frederick Barrett and a few others, actually volunteered to work down below the, to pump out the water to save the Titanic and buy some time. As these men were down in the boiler room, number five, Frederick Barrett lifted up one of those big heavy manholes to run pump hoses into boiler room number six, trying to buy some time for the sinking. However, Jonathan Shepard, he wasn't aware of where he was going, you know, he was not aware of his surroundings, accidentally and unexpectedly fell in a manhole and broke both of his legs. And fireman Frederick Barrett was able to assist him and basically took him to the pump room. And due to the great pressure of the thin metal coal bunker wall that is designed, that is actually not designed to be watertight whatsoever, a huge tsunami of water overtook the men down below. Frederick Barrett was able to survive that tsunami of water and actually made his way up to the top by escape ladder. Now, 
There's this video from a docudrama called What Sank the Titanic. They actually did a great job with the scene of the bunker wall giveaway, and I will provide you that video with the audio intact. Moving! Boiler Room 6 had by now completely filled with water, and its bulkhead collapsed. And seeing that wall is just very, very unbelievable. And seeing that video is also very unbelievable. How they actually did try to save the Titanic. But unfortunately, it was just too much. And basically, the wall had to give way. Up on the boat deck, passengers actually report seeing mass lights in the horizon from a mystery ship in the distance. From what it actually did believe, it looks like it's a series of mass lights. The ship you see in this photo is the Leyland Steamer, the SS Californian. She was roughly 10 to 15 miles away from the Titanic and was stopped. And throughout the night, they had their radio system shut down due to Jack Phillips' rebuttal. An officer by the name of Second Officer Herbert Stone, along with Junior Officer James Gibson, who were actually both upon deck of the Californian, happened to notice lights of a nearby ship and rockets were fired, despite them being white or in many different colors. Captain Stanley Lord, who happened to be in the chart room around that time, decides to risk full speed ahead, having to push through loose ice, and Stone reports that the Titanic is going down fast at the head. So the California is actually working up to 13 knots, but they wouldn't be able to reach the vessel in time. At first, they didn't know what was going on, but didn't bother to wake up the wireless operator. Now, here's a poll question for the viewers in the live chat. If you were the officer of the watch and actually do happen to notice the ship out in the distance, acting weird and firing off rockets, you know, what would you do? Leave your comments down in the comment section below and I'm going to read through them. And if you're watching this in the live chat, uh, leave a response. I like to see a response whatsoever. So, and my answer for this one, I would basically wake up the wireless operator and have them get in contact with the ship to see what the problem is, you know, see what the issue is, you know, try to understand the situation more. The rockets going up and the ship acting weird is enough to basically put the two and two together. Now, people like to scrutinize Captain Stanley Lord and the crew of the Californian for not doing anything. But the one thing they're actually guilty of, and I'm actually going to clear, clear all their names, but this is the one part that they are guilty of, is basically they didn't put the two connections together. You know, a ship stopped at 11.40 p.m., matches the time script, and then it just kind of acts weird, firing off rockets. It's just enough to put the two and two together. Had they put the connections together, they would actually understand what's going on. Now we're at the point where all order is getting ready to break down because the ultimate realization is that already half of the lifeboats are already gone. The Titanic is up to her final hour as 160 passengers out of the 2,208 have already been evacuated. The band played waltzes, marches, and songs to keep the passengers calm and in order. A notable patriotic tune called The Land of Hope and Glory is played and is actually one of my favorites as well. One song that the band played a lot of times during the sinking is Irving Berlin's song called Alexander's Ragtime Band. It is around this time at 1.15 a.m. that guns were issued to senior officers and Cap of Captain Smith, Chief Officer Henry Wilde, First Officer William Murdoch, and Charles Lightoller. These guns, however, were kept in the lockbox in the First Officer's quarters, and since it was originally Lightoller's room, he forgot to notify Murdoch about the guns that were in his room throughout the voyage until now. Lightoller, when he was given his, saw no reason to need it, but Chief Officer Henry Wilde shoved the gun back into Lightoller's hand and said, You may need it. Lightoller then put the gun in his pocket, unloaded. Another dramatic turn to the sinking of the Titanic is the opening of the D-deck gangway door on the port side. Now, earlier in the video, Second Officer Charles Lightoller ordered six men to go down to the D-deck gangway door and open it, and so that way there's a means of passengers getting off the ship from there. There's one big problem, though. You have to remember, this gangway door is 
much bigger than the iceberg damage that was actually inflicted on the Titanic. It actually gives water free will and free access into more open areas of the ship that are still dry. And this would also have an effect on the list of the ship as well. So a lot of speculation like to say that the D-Deck gangway door was actually blown open when the Titanic slammed into the ocean floor. While sure it, it, it was plus plausible but it was never been confirmed anyway. You see, Charles Lytar did order men down, and these men never came back up. I mean, they were told, Charles Lytar, that the door is open, and Lytar never seen them again, or basically knew that the door was open. A very appropriate way of describing the effect of the list of the Titanic is her future sister ship, the HMHS Britannic. Now, when the Britannic did struck the mine in the Aegean Sea in 1916, it compromised six of the 16 watertight compartments. While, sure, this ship actually did have safety features that were implemented after the Titanic disaster, such as the double hull extending from the bow all the way back to the engine room, and also one added watertight compartment door where the generator from the dynamo is. And basically with six flooded compartments, this basically means that the ship has reached its maximum limit the Britannic and it can stay well above the water. However, one problem is nurses open up portholes along E deck and F deck because it was actually a hot, a very hot day, and this actually allowed water to penetrate further and further into the ship to flood much more quicker, basically bypassing more watertight compartments, in to which that she eventually listed in the final moments. Now, ships usually tend to roll over on their sides in the final plunge, but the way Titanic sank is very unique and actually went down on an even heel rather than going over, but I'll, I'll discuss that when we get to it. FIFO 16 is lowered at 1.28 a.m. with an occupancy of 53 passengers. Aboard this lifeboat is a stewardess named Violet Jessup, who previously had an encounter between the HMS Hawk and the RMS Olympic collision in 1911 and will later survive the sinking of Titanic's unmet sister ship, the HMHS Britannic, while she served as a nurse in World War I. But hey, that's another story for another time, and she's a well-known name within the Titanic and Ocean Liner community. She was given a baby to look after by an officer, preferably Moody, Perhaps I'm getting, kind of getting ahead of myself way too quickly with the HMHS Britannic for now. Let me know down in the comments box for a future documentary of the HMHS Britannic. After the lifeboat lowering of Lifeboat 16, 5th Officer Lowe and 6th Officer Moody had a discussion on who should take command of Lifeboat 14. Now Lowe actually took in charge of this lifeboat due to higher rank and much more responsibility. Lowe also takes a spot after Moody assists, and around that time, orders begin to start to break down around that general front area whatsoever. A crowd one charge into Lifeboat 14 were actually held off by the crew. And Lifeboat 14's only handle was only filled up with 40, and this conversation alone actually determined who will live and who will die. Lifeboat 9 will be lowered at 1.30 a.m. with an occupancy of 40 this would be one of the last few boats that would be lowered to a little over half full. Crew inside lifeboat number 14 were fighting off a mob on the A-deck promenade underneath lifeboat 14. Fifth Officer Lowe fired off warning shots to keep order as the lifeboat was lowered. It would be a sign of things to come. The rest of the lowering without any further incident and no one was shot, but the gunshots calmed the passengers down. The lifeboat 12 proceeded to be lowered at the same time with only 42 occupied seats. Back over on starboard, lifeboat 11 is launched with 50 occupied seats. What they don't know is that there's a condenser discharge they're going to be lowering up on top of it. But luckily, due to the list, they barely touch the water next to it. Next lifeboat to be lowered right away is lifeboat number 13. This is one of the most infamous lifeboats since there's a few individuals in there that we know such as Ruth Becker who actually pushed her way into lifeboat number 13 second class passenger and later author Lawrence Beasley lookout Reginald Lee and in command is fireman Frederick Barrett who survived boiler rooms 6 and 5 50 already occupied the lifeboat and this one went through a series of unfortunate events so what are condensers well 
Titanic actually happened to have two condensers that actually take some seawater from the outside to cool the water that they have as a part of the ship's steam engine. And they were actually designed to transfer heat from the steam back into the water, thus cooling it down. Now, Titanic had two condenser ports. One underneath LIFO 13 and 14, respectively. LIFO 13 was actually lowered up on top of the still discharging condenser underneath them. What they were actually supposed to do was they were actually supposed to slack off from the front end where the bow of the lifeboat is and basically have that swing around and basically release from from the one fall thus disconnecting the rowway from the ship altogether before lifeboat 15 comes down but however things actually did not go the way that they expected the next lifeboat to be lowered is lifeboat number 15 which is full and overloaded by three, making it the only lifeboat to be lowered at its full or beyond capacity. As soon as lifeboat 13 touches the water, the discharge port pushes lifeboat 13 underneath where lifeboat 15 is coming down upon top of Passengers in both 13 and 15 start yelling at the officers up on the top deck to stop, but they could not be heard as the boat was still coming down upon top, thus risking a crushing and swapping. Frederick Barrett, who thought quickly, Grab his knife and start cutting away on the ropes and successfully free lifeboats 13 and 15 that came down into the water safely. Let me tell you one thing, Frederick Barrett's quick thinking actions of cutting the ropes actually did save more lives and he's actually one of the true blood heroes of the Titanic. Now, he survived three different death situations, basically the iceberg collision into boiler room number 6, the collapse of the coal bunker wall in boiler room number 5, and of course, just recently, the lifeboat 15 coming down up on top of 13. And you have to think about this. This man went through hell and back. I will do a dedicated video of Frederick Barrett real soon. After the series of unfortunate events involving lifeboats 13 and 15, lifeboat 2 is launched by Henry Wilde under the command of Joseph Boxhall. Captain Smith wants Boxhall to row around the Titanic to a gangway door and pick up more passengers from there. It is also at this time that the huge bronze propellers started rising up out of the water. Minutes later, lifeboats 10 and 4 were lowered altogether, being the last two regular lifeboats to be lowered. Lifeboat 10 was actually originally in charge by Charles Yalkin, who refused a seat, but it is taken by Steward William Burke along with two other seamen. Yalkin will go down on a deck looking for more women and children, and although he did notice some women and children on deck, he would forcefully take them up on deck and basically throw them into the boat. In one attempt, a woman lost footing and slipped between Lipo 10 and the Titanic, hung upside down, and miraculously, she was hauled into the A deck promenade by Burke. Throughout the night, Charles Yalkin made it his personal mission to make sure, and yes, Make sure that the Titanic goes down with little alcohol as possible. Throughout the night, he's been going down to his stateroom or cabin, whatever you guys like to say it, drink some whiskey, go back up on deck to assist, then go back down to take another swig of whiskey, and then when he came back, all of a sudden, he finds his room underwater. Life of Four was lowered to an A-deck window throughout the whole night. Lightoller and Colonel Gracie proceeds to help women into the lifeboat. He helped two women into the boat, but was actually blocked by a line of crew members. Lightower allowed Gracie to assist the lifeboats. John Jacob Astor allowed Gracie to help his pregnant wife Madeline into this lifeboat and try to offer himself on board. But unfortunately, Lightower declined Astor's request, and the flooding of the Titanic is now progressing much quicker than it previously was. At first, it started off slow, but once the bulkhead wall to boiler room number 5 collapsed and the opening of the D-deck gangway door, it allowed water to flow into the dining room and into more open areas. Back into the wireless room, Jack Phillips started to become in a trance. He zoned out and started having mental breakdowns because he needs to get his ship to them as quickly as possible. It's at this time that he and Bride notice that the power is starting to dwindle down. Now, when we actually do know about this, they had a front row seat to what's going on with the power to the Titanic. The rest of the passengers actually never noticed it. They noticed that the lights instantly went out and that was it. Brian Phillips had a front row seat 
for the power dwindling down. The loss of the power basically closes the circle of how far Titanic can communicate, basically being the first is the Cape Race land station in Newfoundland. The last words he said to the RMS Olympics wireless operators, We are putting the women off in the boats. We are putting the passengers off in small boats. Women and children in boats cannot last much longer, losing power. The power is failing due to the engine room has now been taken on water and the dynamos may fail at any time as Captain Smith informed Phillips of the situation, to which Phillips communicated and tried to get a ship to their location, basically saying engine room getting flooded, engine room getting flooded two times. At this very same time, Captain Smith called lifeboats back to be filled with capacity, but not one of the half-filled boats actually did went back to the ship especially one specific lifeboat, lifeboat number six. As Quartermaster Higgins talked, Molly Brown, Helen Caney, and Mary Eloy Hughes Smith are going back to the ship to pick up more passengers. Give it the credit that the suction will pull us down. The final distress rocket was fired at 1.52 a.m. At this time, the California's officers were able to see it explode over the horizon. Currently, there are two Engelhard collapsible lifeboats that are being filled. C on the starboard side and D on the port side. Titanic also has two additional ones up on top of the officer's quarters, basically collapsible A on the starboard side and B on the port side. Around this time, shots were being fired around collapsible C and two men, two men were witnessed to have guns were Murdoch and Purser Hugh McElroy. As collapsible C would be loaded, witnesses heard two pistol shots in the air and these shots were either an Elroy or Murdoch using pistols to keep back the crowd from storming the lifeboat. Two key witnesses, Eugene Daly and Jack Thayer, said there were two different, which is Murdoch and McElroy all together. It is possible that McElroy fired the two pistol shots while standing inside collapsible sea, to which it canceled out the popular belief of the Murdoch double murder suicide that we saw in the James Cameron film. Captain Smith would relieve the wireless operators of their duty, saying, Men, you have done your full duty. You can do no more. Abandon your cabin. Now it's every man for himself. After the captain gave the order, Phillips continued tapping the Morse key, messaging the SS Virginian, the Baltic, and the SS Asian. Collapsible C would be lowered at 1.56 a.m. with an occupancy of 43. Among those is managing director of the White Star Line, Bruce Ismay. Now, it is unknown if Bruce Ismay actually did took this seat, if he was ordered into it, or took up the opportunity because there was no one around. But regardless of either way, Bruce Ismay would have been scrutinized by the media and be a scapegoat to the sinking of the Titanic. To me, I personally say that Bruce Ismay was ordered into the lifeboat by William Murdoch, and he tried everything to do it in his power to not be spotted by American authorities once he got to New York and tried to order a ship and the crew back to the United Kingdom before being spotted by American authorities and be brought in for questioning. The one thing that actually did not look good on Ismay's part was him signing his name backwards that says Yamsey. During the lowering of Classable C, the boat rubbed against the hull of Titanic, threatening to break apart or flip over the occupants. The occupants push the lifeboat away from the hull as the boat is still being lowered into the water. Collapsible Sea would touch the water with no further incident. As 2 a.m. hits, we now finally enter the final 20 minutes of Titanic's life. As the clock strikes 1 a.m., Titanic's fate hangs in the balance. In the second hour of the sinking, a sense of dread and despair permeates the air, as passengers and crew alike grapple with the grim reality of their situation. 
on board. The ship's crew work tirelessly to maintain order and facilitate the evacuation, but their efforts are hampered by the overwhelming magnitude of the disaster. As the minutes tick by, the Titanic's hull groans and creaks under the strain, her structural integrity compromised by the relentless pressure of the surrounding water. Amidst the chaos and despair, the acts of heroism and selflessness emerge as individuals strive to comfort and support one another in the face of unimaginable tragedy. And then, in the final moments of the second hour, Titanic's fate is sealed as her hull finally gives way, breaking apart under the immense strain. In the final moments of the Titanic sinking, chaos reigns as the crew races against time to save as many lives as possible. It is now 2 a.m. April 15, 1912, 112 years ago today. Titanic now has 20 minutes left to live. The final moments of the Titanic is nigh as there's still 1,500 souls that's actually still on board the Titanic. The only lifeboat to be lowered at this time is Collapsible D, and it was the last lifeboat to be lowered with the use of traditional davits. Altogether, 671 passengers and crew have been evacuated off the ship, but two lifeboats remain on board, Collapsible's A and B. At first, the loading of this lifeboat is very chaotic, as Light Teller noticed a group of men hiding in the lifeboat, to which he pulled out his empty revolver and he tells them, Get out, you damn cowards! I'd like to see every one of you overboard! As Collapsible D is lowered into the water, two men actually did climb into this lifeboat. Their names were Hugh Warner and Mars Stephenson. Now, what they actually did not knew, that up above them was actually Charles Light Teller, who actually saw then these two men get into the boat and he almost yelled at them to get out of the lifeboat but then again he hadn't realized this is the last minutes of Titanic's life so White Toller let them live but he was heavily against it and there were also two more notable figures I actually did cover in a previous video it's also worth mentioning as well are the Titanic orphans of Edmund and Michelle Namtro Jr. who were actually kidnapped by their father during an Easter weekend visit so I will include a link to that video as a card or down in the description box below. Now currently, all the lifeboats are gone except for these two collapsible lifeboats up here. And the only way to get them down is basically from the officer's quarters. So basically we have collapsible A here, collapsible B here. The only way to get them down is remove the covers and use these oars to make a makeshift ramp to slide the lifeboats off the deck and get them hooked and lowered away. But the biggest problem is that is there is not enough time as the wire is about to envelop the bridge. In the wireless room, faint messages were heard as Jack Phillips was still transmitting as Titanic is dramatically losing power. Harold Bride was busy in the office gathering their stuff so they could get up onto the boat deck and get off the ship together. As Bride was currently distracted and Jack Phillips was completely oblivious to his surroundings, a stoker came in to undo Phillips' life jacket and as Bride came back into the wireless room, he noticed this and started getting the stoker off of him. The fight between the stoker and Harold Bride is enough to snap Jack Phillips out of the trance and use a heavy blunt object to subdue the threat. And once the stoker is neutralized, the wireless room is now abandoned. Both Jack Phillips and Harold Bride went their separate ways as Bride went to help at Glassville B. And it was around this time that Captain Edward J. Smith ordered an abandoned you, ship and the band played the final hymn, Here Am I God to Thee. Now when people ask about what was the final song that was actually played on the Titanic, it is one of the popular questions surrounding the final moments of the sinking. To me, I believe it's Near My God to Thee, but it took until one specific author, one of a popular book in 1957 called A Night to Remember by Walter Lord, said that it was actually Autumn that was actually played. Now, you can actually do take that one with a grain of salt, though, but to me, it's going to be near my god, but I always kind of believe it's actually both of them anyway, both Autumn and near my god, the. So basically, Autumn was basically the uh, prelude song before near my god, the was basically the fina ultimate finale song. Prior before the sinking of the Titanic, and prior before the main voyage, Wallace Hartley, who is the bandmaster, who himself is a Methodist as well, when he was asked by a friend about what final song he would play, he would actually quote this, If I were ever on a sinking ship, I don't think I could do better than play Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, or Near My God to Thee. Class A and B were pushed off the top of the officer's quarters, 
Classical A would land right side up, and B would land upside down, pinning Harold Bride. So she stayed in the ring until the water floated up on Classical B. And Harold Bride was able to float out from underneath. And Harold Bride just can't get a break, can he? As passengers started to rush Classical A, gunshots were heard within the vicinity. The attended targets to this very day are still unknown, and whoever was the officer that was suspected was never named as the culprit. It would be possible that it was either Chief Officer Henry Wilde or Chief Purser Hugh McElroy. At 2.10 a.m., Thomas Andrews went to Captain Smith for the very last time, and Thomas said to him, There is no point staying. She is going. This was overheard by Cecil Fitzpatrick, who fainted towards a wall. And at 2.15 a.m., Captain Smith tells the crew, Do your best for the women and children and look out for yourselves. Along the way, he bumped into trimmer James McGann, to which they got a hold of scared and frightened children, and they both leapt into the sea. Captain Smith would not survive, but James McGann would. At the time of this video, you may notice that I didn't actually say that Andrews actually did jump in water with Captain Smith. Basically, a historian friend of mine actually told me there's a possibility that Thomas Andrews did not actually leap into the sea as we previously known in the past. There's a possible chance that Andrews might got pulled down by the suction of what was about to come next. So basically, the popular belief of Andrews or Captain Smith being either in the first class smoking room or inside the wheelhouse respectively waiting for the inevitable end is based off of the 1997 film. Now, Titanic actually did took a plunge and unexpectedly even itself out. And the cause of this was basically the water being shifted back to starboard. Now when ships sink, they actually do tend to capsize like in Britannic's case like what we saw in the previous video. But in this case, whatsoever, the Titanic righted itself on an even keel. So anything unsecured at this time frame actually starts moving forward. And anything from stack plates and wooden furniture actually starts shifted forward to the bow. Another event actually did happen. It was basically Charles Blightoller, who was basically still around in this area, who actually still wants the collapsible be lowered off. But instead... The boat actually floated off because finally the water itself enveloped the bridge. Charles Lightoller was actually pinned to a metal grate to a ventilator basically up here and it looked like that he was going to be gone. He was going to be a goner. But unexpectedly, an unexpected explosion, preferably down in the boiler room, actually shot hot air back him up into the surface near collapsible B. And then the unimaginable happened. The shroud cables for Titanic's first funnel collapsed and fell to starboard. This generated a massive wave that pushed collapsible's A and B away from the ship. Charles Lightoller was missed by inches from the collapsing funnel. Anyone caught around the impact zone were immediately killed, and anyone unfortunate to get caught into the vortex of where the first funnel stood would get pulled down with the ship. Now at this point, that any new openings generated by the breaking of the windows, the cowl vents, or the collapsing funnels is enough for water to flow into. Now the reason that these funnels actually did collapse was that these funnels are actually made from a thin metal. And once the pressure is too great in the base area of the funnel, once it's submerged, the inwards is actually crushed, causing the funnel to collapse. Seconds after the first funnel fell, the crowning jewel of the Titanic, the Grand Staircase, imploded, releasing tons and tons of seawater. The suction pulled in Colonel Archibald Gracie, who held onto a railing, and the second funnel, too, collapsed. As the top exploded in a shower of sparks and fire, as described by Jack Thayer, who jumped into the water after Milton Long did. Unfortunately, his friend would never be seen again. As the unsupported stern rose higher, it reached the maximum height of 23 to 24 degrees, then something happened. Decking started to break apart, loud bangs and explosions were heard, and finally Titanic's structure failed catastrophically, breaking the liner into two massive pieces. Additionally, the tower where Funnel 3 stood also collapsed and another tower aft of the first tower broke off. The dead weight of the bow hung onto the stern for a bit, allowing the stern to quickly take on water. So this, this part is actually going to be a condensed version from a historic travels video that was actually mentioned. When basically water goes inside the hull of the ship, it actually doesn't get heavier, but it actually does lose buoyancy. 
So it actually does depend on what kind of damage that was actually inflicted. Since the Titanic itself did actually lost 6 of the 16 watertight compartments, the water actually pushes the bow further and further down and the final plunge actually rapidly accelerated and shockingly a piece of testimony actually did came from one survivor that was actually around in this area before the breakup and it's by the name of Charles Yalkin as he was actually in the A deck pantry prior to the ship's breakup grabbing a drink of water and then he actually heard what he reported was steel beams snapping and a great rush of the crowd moving aft. Fortunately, he got out of the pantry as the pantry room was destroyed. So what he basically heard was the iron parting. And that's basically his words. So the center of the gravity is actually not necessarily in the center itself, but it's actually in the heaviest areas, which is the engine room. Basically, these big three-story engines... 900 ton reciprocating engines and with the stern rising it basically put a strain and a bend force around the midsection and the hull couldn't take it anymore and Titanic's structure catastrophically failed thus tearing the ship into two massive pieces and also into three and four pieces as two more boat houses actually broke off from the ship as well. The weight of the bow drags the stern up to a near 90 degree angle and the fourth funnel will collapse as the stern began its descent. The bow finally detaches from the ship and begins its descent to the bottom two and a half miles down to the ocean floor, to which says she will never see the light of day ever again. As the stern stayed nearly vertical for a few minutes, the stern finally floods and goes under. A series of air pockets bursting through different areas such as the cargo hatches allowed water to have a new way into the stern of the ship. Wish the stern is in a bad state of condition given the condition the stern went through as it wasn't flooding properly. And then finally at 2.20 a.m. on April 15, 1912, the Titanic disappears into the North Atlantic Ocean, stranding 1,500 passengers to die. As taken from the Titanic book on a sea of glass, the water is 28 degrees Fahrenheit as a normal person has a 10 minute survival time in the water before suffering cardiac arrest. Charles Lightoller said it felt like a thousand knives stabbing him all at once. Contact with the cold of water has an effect on mental health and struggle to survive on finding out what to do in the water. The biggest danger in the water is hypothermia. Hypothermia is the body response when the body core temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The body actually redirects blood to vital organs such as the heart, lungs, and the brain. So imagine swimming around and you lose feeling in your arms and legs and after a certain point you'll end up drowning in the cold. Now keep in mind though this is actually a moonless night so everyone in the water are actually swimming around struggling for life in the darkness. The rest of the lifeboats actually had to listen to the screams and cries from the passengers. So basically this is their hell for them. So half an hour after the Titanic sank the screams began to die down as passengers slowly succumbed to the cold. At 3 a.m., 5th Officer Harold Lowe organized a search party to rescue operation to pick up anyone that could possibly be alive in the water. Unfortunately, he waited for too long as most of the survivors died as possible. Now, keep this in mind though, Titanic sank at 2.20 a.m. and Lowe is in lifeboat 14 and one more, lifeboat number 4 went back to the wreck site to find anyone else that could possibly be alive. But unfortunately, they were met with a sea of bodies. Now, the problem to finding survivors is that it's pure darkness. So the crew would have to go off by sound just to find anyone. So this would actually be evident when Harold Lowe actually rescued a passenger by the name of Fang Lang, who was a third class Chinese passenger, and he was one of the luckiest passengers to ever survive the Titanic disaster. He was actually able to balance himself, you know, keeping his uh, own core body out of the water. But you have to remember, his lands, hands and legs were actually frozen as well. But the biggest importance was basically keep your core body out of the water. Lowe actually looked for any more survivors. Basically, there were three more that were actually rescued, but one of them died, unfortunately, and it would be hours until rescue come for them. The Carpathia arrived at the original distress coordinates, but couldn't find the Titanic anywhere. The crew on board noticed a green light off the port bow of the ship and immediately raced there. The green light could possibly be either the starboard bridge wing, which is your navigation or your running light, to the Titanic as they possibly think the ship is disabled and is still afloat. But as they got closer, 
It turns out that green light that they saw was a flare from Joseph Boxhall in lifeboat number two. Boxhall lit these green flares up to gather all the lifeboats all together. With these flares being constantly lighting up, it brought the Carpathia to the Titanic survivors. The Carpathia started firing flares to let Titanic passengers know that help has finally arrived for them. At 2.20 a.m., the RMS Titanic lost her battle and tragically sank to the North Atlantic Ocean two hours and 40 minutes after collision with an ice storm, stranding 1,500 passengers into the freezing cold North Atlantic Ocean. Carpathia arrived in the same ice field as the Titanic did, and the crew spotted a green light and headed towards the area of where that green flare is. They began shooting off rockets to let Titanic passengers know that help has finally arrived. The first lifeboat to reach Carpathia was lifeboat number two, which is commanded by Joseph Boxhall. This lifeboat was brought aboard at 4.10 a.m. as the sun rises over the North Atlantic Ocean. More and more lifeboats were rowing towards the Carpathia, knowing they had survived the Titanic disaster. 705 were rescued from the sinking, and once they were brought up on the ship, they were provided warm blankets, hot drinks, and a place to rest. Others opted to stay up on deck to look out in the ocean for their loved ones. There were no other survivors found from the Titanic disaster site, within the exception of those in the lifeboats before boarding the Carpathia. No other survivor could be found in the water. Harold Cottom notified all ships on the wireless system, letting them know what happened to the Titanic, and another ship, the SS California, arrived near Cal Carpathia's general location and asked if it could do anything for help. Now remember, Carpa California had no idea what happened to the Titanic, and basically, they steamed up to the ship to see if they can offer any assistance. Because you have to remember, the only reason why California did not know what was going on because their wireless operator at the time, Sarah Evans, actually did shut down for the night following a rude rebuttal from Jack Phillips. The Carpathia transmits to the California, telling them that there is nothing for them to do as the Carpathia is preparing to leave the area. This photograph you see is taken on deck of the Carpathia shows the Californian before the Carpathia left. Californian stayed behind to look for any signs of life, but unfortunately only dead bodies and wreckage litter the debris field. Californian would later leave and resume course. Before the Carpathia left to go to where they need to drop off the passengers, a passenger by the name of Bernice Palmer, aged 17 years old at the time and armed with a Kodak box brownie that she either got for Christmas in 1911 or for her birthday on January 10th of 1912, took photographs of Titanic survivors that were on board the Carpathia. She even took a photograph of the suspected iceberg that sank the Titanic, but there has been other candidates, such as Captain W. Wood's photo that was taken on the SS Estonian during the day of April 14th. He inadvertently dated the photo as 1913 rather than 1912, and this photograph taken by Captain Wood was later sold at an auction in 2020. Another photo popped up was taken by Mr. Linnellian Wald, who is the chief steward of the SS Prince Adalbert. Sorry if I butcher that name. He jotted down a visible smear of paint that is visible on the iceberg. Today, Bernice Palmer's Kodak Brownie box camera is on display at the Smithsonian since 1986 after she donated her camera and photos. As the Carpathia has the Titanic survivors, they wonder what to do with them, either take them back to New York City or to another White Star Line vessel. Another ship, the RMS Olympic, was steaming towards the location where Titanic went down, and they transmitted asking if they can take on the Titanic survivors back to New York City. However, this was ran by Bruce Ismay, and Ismay declined the idea and ordered the Olympic to resume course to Southampton. Now keep this in mind, though, that the Olympic was over 500 miles away and was unable to reach the Titanic in time. The reason of the decline of the Olympic's offer to help was that not only the distance of the ship that was coming in, but it was the fact that the ship is near identical to the carbon copy of the Titanic. And seeing this ship pull up near the Carpathia was actually caused great distress and panic among passengers. Basically, Ismay just notify Olympic, stay hidden, stay out of sight, don't let anyone see you. 
On April 9, 17, 1912, the light cruiser of the USS Chester escorted the Carpathia to New York. Harold Cottom, by then assisted by Harold Bride, started transmitting names of third-class survivors to the Chester. Carpathia encountered heavy thunderstorms and fog since the early morning of Tuesday, April 16, 1912, with a sombering tone as the Carpathia slowly begins to make her way to New York. Carpathia arrived in New York City on April 18, 1912, first by having third-class passengers disembark and under tenders to Ellis Island. Carpathia also made her way to the White Star Line Pier, Pier 59, which is Titanic's original location. Photographers witnessed the lowering of the lifeboats into this pier, and then finally, the last of the remaining survivors disembarked at Pier 54, which is the Cunard Pier. Now, even though that these people did survive, their lives were actually altered forever. Not one person was unaffected and had to carry the memory and the horror of that night for the rest of their lives. Afterwards, the United States and the British Titanic inquiries were underway. While I'm not going to cover the inquiries entirely, I will do a dedicated video about it somewhere in the future. So this is going to be a brief rundown of the inquiries that happened. The U.S. Senate inquiry, chaired by this man, Senator William Alden Smith, took place in April and May of 1912. This involved extensive testimonies from the survivors, the crew members, and experts in maritime safety and shipbuilding. The inquiry uncovers some shortcomings in the ship's design, the construction, and safety measures, including the insufficient number of lifeboats and the lack of coordination. The British Board of Trade Inquiry, chaired by this man, Mr. Lord Mercy, commenced after the United States Senate inquiry and lasted from May to July of 1912. The findings for both the Titanic inquiries actually did play a huge role and both highlighted the need for improved regulations regarding lipo capacity and safety equipment, proper training and handling emergency situations as the loss of life could have been minimized and prevented with better organization and preparedness. As we close this documentary, what were the lessons learned during the Titanic disaster? After the Carpathia dropped off the 705 Titanic survivors at Pier 54 on April 18th in 1912 and following the tragic sinking of the Titanic, the world was left reeling from the profound loss of life and the sovereign realization of the fragility of human endeavor in the face of nature's unforgiving forces. However, from the depths of this catastrophe emerged invaluable lessons that would reshape maritime safety practices and regulations for generations to come. The Titanic disaster underscored the formidable challenge of navigating the treacherous waters of the North Atlantic, serving as a stark reminder of the inherent risk posed by nature's unpredictability. It highlighted the need for enhanced preparedness and respect for the power of the elements. In the wake of the Titanic tragedy, governments worldwide enacted sweeping reforms aimed at bolstering maritime safety. These included mandates for more stringent ship construction standards, improved crew training, and the establishment of regulatory bodies tasked with overseeing maritime operations. Perhaps one of the most enduring lessons of the Titanic disaster was the crucial importance of sufficient lifeboat capacities. The ship's inadequate number of lifeboats, coupled with ineffective deployment procedures, resulted in an unnecessary loss of life, Subsequent regulations mandated that all ships carry enough lifeboats to accommodate every passenger and crew member aboard. The Titanic's distress signals transmitted via wireless telegraphy played a critical role in summoning aid and saving lives. In response, the Radio Act of 1912 was enacted to regulate the use of wireless communications at sea, ensuring the ships mandated constant contact with shore stations and other vessels. And to prevent future maritime disasters caused by the icebergs, the International Ice Patrol was established, and this cooperative effort between multiple nations aimed to monitor and track icebergs in the North Atlantic, providing vital information to ships transiting through the region and helping to mitigate the risk of collisions. As the sink of the Titanic served as the ultimate catalyst and the biggest wake-up call for ongoing research and study into maritime safety, Subsequent sinkings, such as the Empress of Ireland in 1914 and the Lusitania in 1915, further underscore the needs for continued vigilance and improved in maritime practices. Today, the wreck of the Titanic lies in the depths of the North Atlantic Ocean, serving as a haunting and solemn reminder 
of one of history's most tragic maritime disasters. Discovered in 1985 by a joint American-French expedition led by Dr. Robert D. Ballard, the wreck rests approximately 12,500 feet or 3,800 meters below the ocean surface. Over the years, numerous expeditions have been conducted to study and document the Titanic wreck, revealing new insights into the ship's final moments and the conditions of its resting place. Despite the extreme depth and the harsh environment, the wreck has remained remarkably well preserved due to the cold temperatures and lack of natural light to such depths. The Titanic wreck is divided into two main sections, roughly 600 meters apart, with the bow section lying upright on the ocean floor and the stern section resting nearby, largely flattened and fragmented due to the force of its descent. The debris field surrounding the wreck is scattered with artifacts and remnants of the ship's once grand interiors, providing a poignant glimpse into the lives of those who sailed aboard her. While the Titanic wreck serves as a solemn memorial to the lives lost on that fateful night in April 1912, it also continues to be a subject of scientific inquiry and exploration. Submersible vehicles equipped with advanced technology have allowed researchers to conduct detailed surveys and high-resolution images of the wreck site, shedding new light on the circumstances surrounding the sinking and the long-term effects of deep-sea exploration on the Titanic's fragile remains. However, the Titanic wreck also faces significant threats from the natural processes such as corrosion as well as human activities such as salvage operations and tourism. Efforts to preserve and protect the wreck are still ongoing, with calls for the site to be designated as an International Maritime Heritage Site to ensure its protection for future generations. In summary, the Titanic wreck remains a powerful and evocative symbol of human triumph and tragedy, serving as a testament to the enduring legacy of one of history's most iconic ships. In conclusion, the story of the Titanic is one that continues to captivate and resonate with people around the world. From its inception as a marvel of engineering and luxury to its tragic demise in the icy waters of the North Atlantic, the Titanic's journey served as a poignant reminder of the fragility of human ambition in the face of nature's forces. Through the stories of those who sailed aboard her, we have glimpsed the triumphs and tragedies of the human spirit, the courage of the survivors, the heroism of the crew, and the heartbreaking loss of so many lives. The Titanic disaster sparked a global reckoning with maritime safety, leading to sweeping reforms and regulations that have reshaped the industry to this very day. As we reflect on the legacy of the Titanic, let us honor the memory of those who perished aboard her and pay tribute to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. May their stories serve as a reminder of the importance of vigilance, preparedness, and compassion in the pursuit of safer seas for all. Though the Titanic now rests in the depths of the ocean, her story still lives on, a testament to the enduring power of remembrance and the lessons learned from one of history's greatest tragedies. Well, here we are, again in the documentary. So, there's a lot of people I do like to thank that actually helped me out with this documentary. Um, one of them is actually Cez Francis, who allowed me to use part of her classical B script to be featured in this documentary. And I also like to not only thank her for this documentary, but also my good friends along with Cez, such as Mr. Britannic's Jake himself. And there's also more as well, such as Miss Elizabeth, who actually helped me motivate me to get the uh, documentary done. So, Elizabeth, if you're watching this, this, thank you. And also, Maritime History for the fact-checking, along with uh, Mr. Thomas Andrews on Discord. So, if you guys are watching this, thank you guys. And also, another one I would like to thank is Sam from Historic Travels for actually inspiring me to do this whole documentary from the construction all the way to the sinking. And I will do a combination of all the videos that you just watched into one giant documentary. And if he's watching this, I also like to thank him for being a very good sport as well if he watches this whole video. I love his documentary that he did on the Titanic years ago, but I actually did point notice some inaccuracies in it whatsoever. So this documentary is basically a very huge update to the one that he did in the past. And you know what they say, new information actually do come to light and some corrections did have to be made whatsoever. So if he watches this, you just uh, learn something new, man.
The videos that you saw came from the few docudramas dramas such as Titanic, Building of a Legend, and Saving the Titanic, along with uh, the animation from Titanic, Honor and Glory, and of course scenes from the 1997 James Cameron film, along with Tom Linsky's The Last Signals. Now, I will be doing a documentary on the discovery of the Titanic in the later future, and also one on the Titanic inquiries as well. So, the Titanic timeline, it's not over. It's still ongoing. This is just the start. But hey, I will be doing a new documentary soon. But unfortunately, the Lusitania one, the one I, I was actually planning, is going to be on the back burner until next year. Considering that 2025 is the 110th anniversary of the sinking of the Lusitania. But this one, for this year, is the 110th anniversary of the sinking of the RMS Empress of Ireland. So expect a documentary from that real soon. So... Once again, if you like this whole documentary and if you enjoyed watching this from start to finish, leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more. And just as we wrap up Titanic Week, I just want to say thank you guys for tuning in. Whether you watch these videos from Discord, you possibly saw them in the self-promo channels. So just want to say thank you.